Hare Krishna, Kostava Prabhu. Welcome to the Monks Podcast. Now, it's been my aspiration to have you on this forum for a long time. Because uh, now I've seen you to be, I would say, a thoughtful, cutting edge, contemporary outreach in an area where not many are have been as effective as you are. So I'm very grateful that you are here today with us. Well, Prabhu, I'm honored to be here <laughs> and I will uh, share whatever I can. Thank you. Yes. So I'll just quickly read your introduction. So then you can, okay. we can have more personal discussion. So Kostuba Das has a special way of making the teachings and practices of yoga very approachable and relevant. He serves as a senior educator of the Bhakti Center in New York City and is the co-host of the Wisdom of the Sages Yoga Podcast, which has been ranked number one in the world on Apple Podcasts in the category of religion and spirituality. Now, that's remarkable since it's, yeah, you have just got one year, you started it, we'll talk about that, it's amazing. Between the ages of 21 and 24, he lived as a Vaishnava monk, traveling and studying in ashrams in India and America. He teaches Bhakti Yoga, Philosophy and Meditation, which has practiced for over 30 years in the Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition. So, I think your introduction itself indicates the way you have uh, even evolved and positioned yourself in the mission of outreach. Hmm. So, can you tell me how, since you are specializing now in outreach in yoga, how did you come to that genre of outreach? Since if you were a monk in the ashram in, in a ISKCON temple, from there, it must have been quite a journey to come to this level, uh, this kind of yeah. outreach. Well, you know, I, I so yeah, I, I was a brahmacharya monk from 87 till 2000. Um, you were introduced in? In New York City. In which year, roughly? In 1987. I mean, a little bit earlier than that. Um, my, I had friends that were uh, interested in, in, in bhakti yoga, oh. or interested in Krishna consciousness. So uh, I was, from my teenage years, from when I was about 15, I had some exposure mm -hmm. and some of the kids that were in the scene that I was in, which was kind of like the New York City punk rock underground scene, uh, some of the more influential kids. And when I say kids, they I was 15 and they might have been my age or up to like 19 or 20. Um, they had an interest in Krishna consciousness. Uh, so I had, I had some exposure to it during mm -hmm. that time, but it was really a few years later when I was about... 19 or 20 that I began to read Prabhupada's books and get more interested. Um, and oh, so, yeah, yeah, so then in 1987, I, I actually became a monk myself. <laughs> so 1920 is so, quite yeah. young. So, so there's a few years of that building, but yeah. I started getting, yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe, but I mean, you know, that was about our, 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 our age, you know, that people were getting interested in it, I think. Oh, interesting. So then uh, were you having some, some educational background at that time or means what was your overall background when you came uh, in? Very little. <laughs> I'm not like you. No, no, no. But means what I, was your... You know, I had... Um, I had in general, what was your educational background? I had background? graduated. In general, yeah. your education... Well, I grew... Yeah. Yeah, I, I had graduated from high school. Okay. Um, but to be honest... Uh, uh, in in um, the world that I was absorbed in, which was this, this kind of, and it, you know, people in America may know this, people in India may not understand it as much, but it was this punk rock subculture, uh, we call a hardcore subculture, was um, as particularly at the time that I was involved in, which was early on, it was kind of a very anti-social rebellious kind of um, person. And so I really had lost interest in school. And oh. in school, they placed me in a special program, you know, that was experimental. Uh, oh, behind okay. the school, they had like a little trailer <laughs> and they put a few <laughs> of us in there and they tried to give us some kind of special education. And uh, what it effectively meant was most of my high school years, I didn't really even have to attend school all that much. And they kind of just let me out at the end. Um, so oh. I, I had a high school degree. Um, but I, 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 yeah, college was out of the question. There was no, 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 I had no intention of going attending college and I really wasn't sure what I was looking for in those, uh, teenage years. Amazing. 
So I thought that the hippie counterculture was it more or less ended by the 70s, but still there's something else which was somewhat similar that was there in the late 80s also. Yeah, similar. Well, this was early 80s. That let's say when I was like say I yeah, okay, began to get involved in when I was about uh, 15 or so in 1981. Uh, the 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 punk rock and the hardcore scene was um, it was. In some ways, it was similar to the hippie thing. It was far less popular, far, far, far less known, um, and it was a bit more shocking to people. I think the way that we looked in the the music itself, um, but it did share some of the um, kind of. It looked at mainstream society as hypocritical. Um, mm. I think it shared that in common. You know, that maybe that was a big thing it shared in common. So yeah, it was people that were interested in some alternative way of living an alternative way of looking at the world. I mean, I think you could say that. Oh, okay. And, uh, it was a bit more, you know, it was a bit of a wild, it was a bit of a scary world, I think, for a lot of people. But somehow, and this is, this is an interesting point, somehow in the midst of that world, which was very gritty, it was drug ridden, it was violence ridden, it was, it was kind of, a, it had a dark side to it for sure. Hmm. But it was a lot of, but there was a lot of youth and there was a lot of, um, I, I would, I suppose I would call it, um, idealism, uh, mixed in with it. And, but somehow or other where that scene took root in New York city was right in the very same place where Srila Prabhupada, you know, planted the seed of Bhakti, which took root, uh, which was, um, the Lower East Side of New York city. And even specifically, the area of Tompkins Square Park, where Prabhupada began uh, doing public kirtans, it was right, that was kind of the very center of our New York City punk rock hardcore scene. That's amazing. Uh, so somehow I believe that, yeah, I believe that the, the blessings of that place kind of rubbed off on us. Oh, okay. So I'm just making some notes because this is fascinating. You're okay with that, I hope. So, okay. <laughs> So, just, so were the Hare Krishnas also a part of this punk rock or uh, subculture or, or were they, uh, our, were, did we have a presence at that time? We might not have been a part of it. Yeah. But like in the in New York City, culture, yes. we were a well-known, we were a visible presence. But were we at that time or our movement had become a little less influential at that time? Yes, it was less influential at that time. But in that, um, in New York City, there was certainly, there certainly was, uh, you know, every city had their hardcore scene, we would call it. And again, it was a very underground group of young people that most people didn't even know about. Um, and uh, yeah, in New York, in New York City, uh, devotees would come out to the concerts that we had and distribute prasadam, distribute prasadam uh, in Tompkins Square Park. So they were visible to us. And, uh, and then... Uh, one or two people developed an interest in it in the, within that scene, and mm. it started to grow. And so, therefore, that um, that connection grew too. You would see devotees at at certain events, and uh, there was always talk about it. And then, one influential band record, or actually more than one, but uh, several bands began to build Krishna conscious concepts into their art or into their music. Oh. And then in later years, like in the 90s, you know, my buddy Raghunath, he would start a whole scene of music that they called Krishna Core, you know, which was uh, bringing directly, you know, very directly um, Krishna conscious themes to the music. And at that point, oh. it grew much more. But I was into it in the early 80s uh, up to the mid 80s. That okay. kind of took off in the 90s. Oh, okay. So do you feel that this uh, background made you receptive for Krishna consciousness in some ways, although it was, it might seem quite radical and uh, disruptive, but uh, yeah. do you feel it, it made you receptive for Krishna consciousness in some way? I do, um, because, and this is the point that I think a lot of people uh, may have a difficult time understanding, but in that time that I was involved in it as a 15, 16 year old, 17 year old, mm. uh, the way that we dressed and the way that we looked, um, it was almost like a social suicide. It was almost like once you presented yourself this way, it felt like not only were you turning on the world, but the whole world was turning on you. <laughs> and um, 
And so you really were ready, like a lot of the things that may have made someone hesitant to fully embrace. And, and it, you know, this isn't so much a problem now. Now, if you get interested in bhakti in America, you don't necessarily have to radically change the way that you dress or, but then you did. And so for, for a young man, for instance, to shave his head, to put on a dhoti, to put on tilak, it's, it's, um, you lose all your friends, you lose, you know, it's like people think you've completely gone insane. That's, that's the way it was. And to have already done that as a 15 year old in the punk rock world made it much easier to do so <laughs> as a 20 or 20 year old, you know, to put on a dhoti and, and all of that. So there was that, that was part of it. But, and I think another part of it was that there was an idealism in that music. There was a, a way of, of saying, yeah, I'm looking at the world. I'm looking at mainstream society. I see that it has no clear direction. I, I, I see the hypocrisy in it. I'm looking for truth. You know, I really want something genuine and something true. Mm. And so uh, I think, you know, a lot of people that were interested in that music in that world were naturally ripe to hear Krishna consciousness. Um, and when we read Prabhupada's books, they rang true with us. Amazing. So literally, we could say that what Prabhupada did in the 60s, that continued to happen to some extent in the 80s also. Like the disaffected people from mainstream society, they were attracted. So specifically, what about Prabhupada's yeah. books did you, did rank true to you? What attracted you? You know, um, I'll say this too. Uh, as I, um, as I, came into my late teens, it wasn't only punk rock music, but it was also a, a lot of the music I was listening to was reggae music. Okay. And, um, and there, of course, Bob, Bob Marley was like the major figure. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with him, Prabhu. Do you know Bob Marley at all? I've heard the name, but not much more than that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that was, you know, that was music coming out of Jamaica uh, and very much influenced, very much influenced by Rastafarianism. And, oh, okay. uh, and which is stemming out of biblical teachings. And so uh, when I, you know, I was a, at that point in my life, I was a really, I would say my favorite musician and one of the biggest influences on my life was Bob Marley. And okay. um, when I would hear Prabhupada's, or like say, read his conversations, like in a book, say like the science of self-realization, hmm. it really reminded me of a lot of the ways that Bob Marley would speak. Um, about spirituality and, and um, the way that he would look at the world, sum it up, um, uh, the way that he would even use language. Uh, it actually did remind me a lot of about a lot of Bob Marley. But books like Science of Self-Realization, uh, that was a real important book. Uh, the Cause of Vegetarianism and the way that it was presented, say, in a book like um, uh, High, the Higher Taste, which was a cookbook, but it had a lot of information on vegetarianism, which is more widely available now, but at that time in the 80s was not so widely available. That was a real eye opener too. So books like The Higher Taste, books like uh, um, Science of Self-Realization, uh, okay. and also books like, uh, there was a book at that time, uh, Coming Back, which was an explanation of reincarnation. These fundamental concepts of karma, reincarnation, the importance of vegetarianism and how that plays into both of those uh, concepts, uh, these are all really ringing true. And then again, just like well, more or less everything that you find in, um, in, in, in a book like The Science of Self-Realization was ringing true. And, 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 the, and again, the way that, that Srila Prabhupada could point at, hey, this whole, this whole civilization is misdirected, right? The, the way that he could articulate that with my friends and myself uh, was very effective. And I should make this point too, and, and, and it might, you know, for a lot of listeners, they might not understand, but within that hardcore scene in New York City, which again was in a very gritty kind of, you know, violent drug culture, all that was there. I, I had a group of friends that I was close with that were, I would say they were very influential in that world. And they were also the kids that were really um, 
the most, you know, deeply absorbed in that kind of thing. Like, in other words, the scariest kids and the kids that were doing all of the most wild stuff, you know, uh, living the most wild lifestyles, uh, mm -hmm. somehow it was particularly those kids that got most interested in, in, in uh, Prabhupada's books. And these really tough street kids, you know, like these are like kind of like thugs, you know, I love them all and I have great appreciation for them, but they were tough kids. They could read Prabhupada's books and come back and articulate important philosophical or theosophical concepts and debate with people. And, you know, we were growing up in the streets of New York and in the parks of New York and on the stoops of, on the streets of New York and um, talking with each other all the time. And, you know, you'd sit in a place like Tompkins Square Park or Washington Square Park. There was a lot of social interaction going on there. And so we would discuss these topics with all kinds of people. And I would watch my friends who were like these tough New York City street kids, really kids, you know, debate with people. Uh, and basically their arguments were all coming from Srila Prabhupada's teachings, which were presented in real clear, simple ways. And they were very effective. And this was really impressive to me. I'll say that, you know, this was really impressive that I could see that my friends were able to Amazing. talk to anyone you know uh you know, these weren't educated people these are people that dropped out of school you know these are people that didn't, didn't want to speak of going to college or anything like that but just from their conversations with devotees and with their readings of Srila Prabhupada's books they, they were really able to um present present their their point of view really very effectively so that that after a year or two of being engaged in that kind of thing uh and that coinciding with my countercultural and you know outlook and my reggae music and and a bit of a um, disillusionment in some of the other counterculture, mm. you know, seeing the same kind of things in the counterculture as you see in the mainstream culture, the same kind of hypocrisy and the same kind of small mindedness and the same kind of cruelty and, and all of that, all of that was kind of blending together. And my attraction really went to Srila Prabhupada's books. Uh, so again, signs of self-realization, coming back, uh, higher taste, of course, Bhagavad Gita, Sri Shopanishad. Those books uh, were real important to me at that time in my life. Amazing. So, <clears throat> now, was there something about Srila Prabhupada's style of presentation also, where he was a little cutting, but that spoke to people who are already critical of mainstream society and that style sort of yeah. resonated with them at that time? Absolutely. <laughs> no question. <laughs> oh, no no question about it, for sure. Oh, okay. That's amazing. Yeah. So, you know, so for people who are... Uh, in, in some sense, my understanding was that, you know, there are many of the... Now, I, I thought of this in the, for the 60s, but you're saying this applies for the hardcore punk rock culture in the 70s, 80s also that in the now, 80s. many of them were already early 80s that they were already rebelling against mainstream society. But Prabhupada gave them like a philosophical mm -hmm. foundation for their rebellion, a philosophical foundation and a spiritual direction. Yes. Both. So, yep. so that yeah. style resonated very well. Yeah. Okay. So then for you, in a sense, becoming a monk was... Was it like a big decision or it was just a natural flow, natural development from where you were? Um, well, the way that it worked for me was so my friends who were, again, these really influential people, like influential in the music world and, and um, kind of legendary in the neighborhood even. Okay. Uh, but, um, but uh, you know, just to talk to some of them, they were kind of like, they had a lot of charisma, you know? Mm. And, um, and, and so after... Um, you know, a year or so of kind of like, you know, speaking on these subjects a lot and hearing a lot about it. Hmm. Um, I began to want to be, I began to read the books and, and they were ringing true with me. But, you know, again, a group of my friends, they were all wearing these Tulsi beads, you know, that was kind of like a little symbol, like, okay, that guy's gotten into it now. <laughs> you know? okay. So I wasn't quite ready to say, this is my thing. You know, this is, hmm. this is, you know, I, I accept um, but, uh, but I started to read the, and the more I was reading the books, the more they were really ringing true. And, and, and I got to a certain point where I almost felt it's inevitable that this, that I kind of really accept this. Uh, and then one, one day, um, I was walking down the street 
one evening and a friend of mine said to me, you know, there's a, a Hare Krishna program going in, going on in another friend's apartment. Do you want to go see that? And for people that uh, you may not know, but for people that do know, his name was John Joseph. He was the singer of a, one of these friends of mine from that time. And he was a singer of a band called the Crow Mags. And the Crow Mags were one of the first bands to bring Krishna consciousness into that world. So this oh. was a program going on in his apartment on the Lower East Side of New York. And uh, so my friend saw me and he said, you know, there's that program going on. You're going to, you, you think you want to go to that? And I was like, oh, man, not really, you know, I'm not so interested. And, uh, and he said, well, you know, they'll have, um, they'll probably have good food there. You know, I said, you know what, you're right. You know, cause we had all had prasadam at different times, their circumstances. So, yeah. so it was really because of that, that I said, yeah, maybe I ought to go over there. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to his apartment, which was in a real uh, tough neighborhood on the Lower East Side. And, uh, I was there with my friends who again were these were kind of tough street kids and um there was maybe it was a very small apartment it was much cleaner than i had ever seen it before because a special guest was coming to speak okay. and um there was only i don't know how many of those were of the of us were there but my guess is maybe like five six seven of us hmm. um and this i just knew the special speaker was supposed to be coming um and then in walked to Krishna goswami Oh, and amazing. my friends were all like down on the ground. I never seen this kind of behavior, but you know, my friends are like bowing down on the ground and really showing him respect. And then he spoke, uh, just to the handful of us. Uh, I, I, I should really try to find the tape of this conversation. I'd love to hear it again. Um, but, uh, he spoke, I, I remember the theme was that when something material is engaged in a spiritual way, it becomes spiritualized. Um, and so, uh, after that talk that night, as I was walking out of that apartment and, you know, going home in my mind and in my heart, I knew this was it. There's no doubt. Uh, I have to dedicate myself to this. And at that point I began practicing the, the regulative principles and chanting 16 rounds. And, um, and in New York city at that time, there was a lot there was like four four days a week. There was something to attend, you know, publicly. There was a there was a small center in Greenwich Village that did programs on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Mm -hmm. And in the temple in Brooklyn on Sunday, there was a program. So that was four programs a week, four times to eat prasadam a week. You know, uh, also this you know meet devotees in the park, and then my friends. We were all talking about it all the time. So mm -hmm. uh, from January through that that following summer, uh, I was getting deeper and deeper into it, still not knowing where exactly it was going to go. And then in September of 1987, Gunagrahi Maharaj invited me to go And so I uh, said, okay, you know, let's do that. And that was kind of the beginning of my years as a monk. I just kind of left my apartment, left my job, left everything and just joined him and and uh, within a, a month or two of that, I said, okay, you know, let's, let me be a monk too. Amazing. So that's how it developed. Okay. So, you know, I would love to go over your monk years also, but then we have to come to the yoga thing. So maybe we could go a little fast forward on that part. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> oh, yes, yes, yes. So no, okay. no, I, I wanted to know. I, I only yeah, asked so how did that it. start? So, yeah. so I only wanted to, I only asked in detail about this, but. You know, so yes. in one sense, what changed in America so much if the counterculture uh, to some extent was so appealing, but in many ways, that way of presentation uh, or the, the appeal of Krishna consciousness that was there at that time, that is not there, say now 20, 30 years down the line. So I, I presume that your change in orientation also was a response to the change in the environment. So maybe you could go over those factors of how you evolved as a sure. monk in response to the environment. Yeah, sure. Um, I um, became a disciple to Mal Krishna Goswami after that. Mm. And in one sense, you can say as a monk, my service was more in that traditional Hare Krishna framework. You know, I, I was a book distributor. I distributed books every day. I did it for from 87 through 2000. That was my Absolutely. thing. Okay. Yeah. And so, um, 
um, at the same time, he became quite a progressive thinker. You know, uh, he went back into the university and mm -hmm. so on in about, I think that was about 94, maybe 93. I think it was 94 that he went back into university and in the academic world. And I think, well, I don't think I know that he was um, kind of sensing what you just mentioned, which may have been a more no novel idea at the time that, yeah, you know, in the 60s and the 70s, you could just take a kirtan into any park in any city in, New in, in America and do some kirtan. And there's going to be a bunch of people that are interested and they'll come back to the temple with you and a few of them will never leave. You know, it's just kind of, you know, there's a lot of young, intelligent people that were really earnestly searching for truth and ready to radically change their lifestyle to find it. And um, as the hippie thing kind of died down, that wasn't so prominent. And mm. so uh, how, how can we make this relevant? And, and you know, th that was a question. And he was certainly exploring that himself. But in terms of his relation, like my training by him, how he trained me, um, he wasn't training me how to sell books, you know, he was training me more how to think. Um, and so he, he used to do this with me that um, in the mornings, every morning, we would chant Japa together in the temple room. And he would kind of call me to sit right next to him uh, every day, you know. And so Just I would a minute. sit. Just a minute. Was he huh? based in New York for a significant amount of time? No, no now, now this is in Dallas. This is in Dallas, Dallas. Texas now. Because oh, so he was going a... to uni... Okay. So you had shifted as a monk to... Uh, to Dallas by this time? Yeah, I, I really, you know, those years, I never moved into any temple because I joined with Guna Grahi Maharaj. So I was always oh, kind of traveling. Okay. Uh, yeah, I was, I was, I wasn't tied down to any temple, but when my guru settled down in Dallas to go to school, hmm. right, he wasn't going to be traveling as much because he's in the university there. Then I spent most of my time there with him, you know, in the same area as him. Oh, and yeah. so, so then he would call me to sit with him, you know, and chant Japa with him. And then towards the end of the Japa time, mm. he would spend five or 10 minutes talking to me. And he would ask me questions. Um, and, I, and it was almost like he was kind of testing me or training me to think. This is how I understand it, that he would ask me a question like, Kastuba, um, so-and-so Swami is doing this over in this part of the world, right? This is how he's presenting bhakti years, you know, uh, what do you think about that? You know, and he, he, you know, I think commonly just like socially our tendency to say, oh, that's wonderful, Jai, you know, whatever, you know, something like that. He wouldn't allow me to answer that superficially, right? If I said that, he would say, why? Why is that such a great thing? You know, um, he would kind of push me or, you know, to um, think critically. I saw it basically as a way of um, training and critical thinking. Um, mm. You know, that kind of in, question in a, itself in, is a, that kind of question itself is a radical question. Uh, at, what do you think about what somebody is doing, especially yes. a senior leader? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, I read, just to give some context, you know, I read yes. most of the Malakrishna Maharaj books and I read especially that essay when he decided to, which he has written in the introduction of his first set of published academic essays, you know, Hare Krishna at uh, Meth Southern Methodist SMU. University, SMU. Yeah. So he talks about his rationale for going into the, uh, into the academia. And it struck me as so amazing. Mm -hmm. So he says basically that through our approaching people on the street, we, ha we have reached a plateau in our influence. If you want to reach further to people, you know, we need to understand them mm -hmm. better so that we can make ourselves understandable to them better. So, so his, so, and that requires. Uh, that was a kind of a radical statement at that time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was all that, you know, the only mode of I'm interaction. Sorry, I'm sorry, is, go ahead. But yeah, yeah. Yeah. We are meant to teach others. It's that, you know, I read in the sort of the, what is the word for it? Say so in the uh, organized, religious organizational theory, there are four modes of uh, interaction. It's like there is insider, insider. Insider, outsider, mm -hmm. outsider, outsider, and outsider, insider. So, insider, insider is like our Bhagavatam classes. 
so inside okay. or bhakti shastri classes then insider outsider is our sunday feast or our book distributions but we we really never cared much mm-hmm. about how outsider outsider happens you know what do people think about us and what do people how people discuss us in our absence yeah yeah uh, there's a lot of negative press there and and outside insider was out of question that you know they have something to teach us so right so i think this was right. also this kind of critical <laughs> You know, I I remember what you're saying now. It's just so many memories are coming up in my mind now of those years with with my guru and like he. I remember him telling me. He says people are coming up to devotees are coming up to me all the time and saying, "Oh, it's great that you're going into that academic world to influence them." But mm-hmm. he said, actually, you know, he said they don't get it. That actually, the primary reason I'm going there is how they influence me. You know, like. he he was going there to learn if people didn't understand that right he was actually going into that world to learn and yeah. um and, and uh but but because um prabhupad's teachings and prabhupad's example was so integrated into his mind and his heart he would go there to learn ultimately to use it to serve yes and um so yeah that that's that's a that's a that's a great way uh useful um A, a useful construct there that's very yeah. interesting but uh that's yeah true. there's we have to be open yeah you know, we have to be open to so so those years of my spending time with him was him opening my mind to some of that that kind of thinking so were you also you kind of a little uncomfortable with that initially or because it was coming from your spiritual master it naturally was something which uh, you found uh, acceptable i don't remember being uncomfortable with it Yeah, okay. maybe I was a little bit at first. I'm not sure to be honest. I don't, re- but I don't remember being uncomfortable okay. with it. Okay. Um, I, I, I think he kind of was already molding my mind to think a little bit like that already. Mm. Um, but um, it was uh, interesting, and and I remember also uh, you're bringing that up. Reminded me also that he said, um, I, I remember this distinctly. One one time he turned to me, and he said that the. That, and and I want to be careful when I say this because um, he was speaking to me privately and um, he wasn't speaking in any way to, in a way that wasn't appreciative of others' service. But he was trying to get me. I felt he was trying to get me to think creatively. And so, more or less, I don't remember the exact words, but what he said was, "The temples in America mm. are no longer effective the way they were." in terms of reaching people with this message and someone has to figure out how to reach people again mm-hmm. in a new way and um and he said and and he says and I don't know what that's going to be but I can tell you one thing it'll have more to do with teaching than it will have to do with preaching that that I always remember that he he told me that beautiful so yeah so in any case uh so you were asking how i got into yoga eventually and mm. so th- this is all connected with that yeah uh, i understand now yeah so, so so after um after 13 years as a book distributor and as a, and a brahmachari i got married um and shortly after that he passed away uh, yeah. so i got i got married in 2001 he passed away 6 months later or maybe maybe 8 months later something like that i i got married in uh the the uh in, in june of 80 of june of 2001 and he passed away i believe in march of uh, 2002 so in less than a year he mm. passed away and uh, by that time i'm living in new york city with my wife and um trying to figure out how i'll serve you know um um in one sense that was you know that 13 years of of brahmacharya that was my education you know that was that was my university oh. but there's not a lot of jobs <laughs> not a lot of paying jobs out there for it. Mm. yeah but um but but i was you know i felt good i felt like i had a good i, I felt like i had a good um training and i was in new york city which is a place where i was excited to be uh back there again and um and in looking around seeing what's happening in the city and you know in terms of what our devotees doing and 
And uh, what could I do? Mm. And what could I do to serve my guru? And at this point in my life, my relationship with Radha Swami had been growing. Um, oh, and okay. so particularly now that my guru had passed on, it was really him that I, when, when I wanted to make some major decisions about my own life, I, I was really going to him. So he, he had no official role in New York City at the time, but he was coming through regularly. And um, after about a year or so in New York City, I came to him with an idea. Um, and that was, um, again, going back to what my guru said, that the temples are, are not so effective in reaching people with this message. Mm. Um, and so I, I brought up an idea and I, I want to be careful. I don't want to say like the whole thing was my idea or something like that. But I did, you know, I did kind of approach him one evening. It was the the night after Rathiatra, the night of the Rathiatra in 2003. And I said to him, you know, um, I'm thinking that maybe we should all be getting together and working on like creating a cultural center rather than a temple. But like a center in the city that's kind of presenting a broader yoga culture where like on one floor there could be a temple you know and a kirtan going on but on another floor there could be a bhagavad gita talk going on and another floor there's a restaurant and there's yoga classes and there's you know meditation classes and you know a, a kind of a broader approach that would be easier for people to walk into and find some kind of relevant way to connect to it he was like yes you know we should do this and i said to him well what's the first step and I was thinking something like, you know, you look for for a, a building, you know, a property or something like that. And he said, you should become a yoga teacher. Uh, that's oh. the first step. And I was, you know, uh, that, that was surprising to me. I had, and I had never had any in particular interest in asana before. I hadn't practiced it at all. Uh, I had no real connection with it. Um, but I just kind of said, okay. You know, if that's, if that's what you're asking me to do, that's what I'll do. And uh, the next day I was, you know, in the yoga studios in New York, kind of trying to find a place to get trained in yoga. Um, so that's how I went into the, the, the um, yoga world, the yoga asana world, was really at Radha Swami's order. You know, I call it order. He called it an order when he said it. Yeah. So yeah. can you tell a little bit about... Uh, your understanding of how American society or American culture itself had changed by this time means uh, yoga. I don't think it was that popular in the 1980s. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Uh, well, this was not. The, yeah. This is now 2003. Yeah, of course. That I, yeah. That I entered into yoga. Yeah. Right. Which is kind of when it was just starting to boom in America. Oh. Okay. Um, yeah. And and so. Um, how yoga had changed you're asking like no, just or, broadly broadly american yeah. society itself has had changed in certain ways because of which say like maharaj also said that uh, our approaches we our temples are not being able to reach and that's why we need yes. to do something else so why do you feel was the need to do something else was it just because say the the counterculture was our primary demographic and that counterculture itself uh, ran out of steam and so yeah. there was no demographic to address. Was I that think the, the the promise of the counterculture was never met? Yeah, you know, uh, you know the the beautiful world that the hippies thought was going to come never quite came. Hmm. And so, like you you said, like you know the the kind of you know the it had no more wind left in its sails, so to say. And so a certain more of a kind of a cynicism or. I don't know if cynicism is the right word, but more of a, you know, they call that next generation, the me generation, you know, people began to think less about, oh, society's going to become this beautiful thing and we're going to change the world. And people just started thinking more about making money and taking care of themselves. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so again, in the sixties, you would have, you know, large numbers of young people that were really ready to change their life drastically in the search for some kind of higher ideal. Mm. Uh, and I think by the time the eighties kicked in, that was largely gone. And so, you know, what to, to a, maybe to a teenager in the sixties or early seventies, when they would see devotees chanting in the street, they would think, Oh, this is beautiful. These are people onto something there. 
you know, they're not interested in the materialistic things. They're interested in you know, finding a new way of living and, and, and so on. They, they may have been, that, that would have been attractive to them. To someone in the 80s, they would probably look at the same people and say, these people are lost. You know, not the world's never going to change and they're not going to change it. And if they're smart, they would figure out, you know, how to, how to find a better circumstance for themselves, you know. I, I'd imagine that's a real generalization, but something okay. like that. Let's say something like that. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's a very, uh, I mean, articulate way of putting it that it's like we were, when people are looking for a radical solution, we present our, we were like a very evident radical solution. But when we, yeah. when people are not looking, for, when people are not looking for that radical solution, then we appear just completely relevant. Yes, yes, mm. yeah. Yeah, I guess yeah. you could sum it up that way. Yeah. So then this was already, so you, so you could say that you were probably a, a part of the remnants of uh, that alternative kind of culture in the 80s. And well, I suppose part. you could say that. Yeah, but it was a new, it was a new one. Yeah, of course. But mm -hmm. it won, but it, it's one that never took off the way that okay. the hippie thing did. It was, it was That's more true. underground. Yeah. Mm. So in a sense, my understanding of how, uh, how yoga is seen in the Western world is that, whereas in the past, the, the counterculture was looking for an entirely different way of living. When, now when people are looking for yoga, it's not so much for an entirely different way of living as for adding value to the way they are presently living. Yeah, that's a, that's a great way to say it, I think. And, and you know, now to fast, maybe I could just mention something else and then, but then come back to this point. Yeah, please. Is that, um, so Radha Swami instructed me to become a yoga teacher in the context of my teaching people yoga in a cultural center that did not exist at that time, right? Oh, okay. That's a really long-term vision then. Yeah, at least, you know, some years. And so that was in 2003. It was in 2000, I think it was about 2007 that we got the building that would become the Bhakti Center. So that was four years down the road. And another couple of years before we were really doing programming, even had the name the Bhakti Center or were presenting programming like my finally teaching yoga. Seven years after that was when I actually became authorized to teach yoga and began to teach it at the Bhakti Center. But by that time, I had so many other duties and services, even for Radha Swami to do, and in terms of the center in general, uh, that it was really kind of time consuming for me to be a yoga teacher. Okay. And there were other people that could teach yoga. But mm. what what by him giving me that instruction, what it did for me was really significant. Mm -hmm. uh, it put me back in downtown New York, which is one of the most influential centers of, you know, s social centers in the world. Mm. It put me back, you know, I had just dropped out of that world as a monk for the past, you know, 13 years and then a couple more on top of that. So about 15 years. And it dropped me right back into the, the the world that I was in, but now we're all a little bit more grown up. And in the yoga in the yoga center where I focused, which was called the Shtanga Yoga New York, um, it was a really interesting place where you had a lot of really interesting people, uh, creative in all different kind of ways. You had a lot. You had a lot of the most famous people in the world practicing yoga there, but even that was kind of an underground place a lot of the most famous musicians in the world, famous actors, writers, uh, musicians. Uh, and then, you know, everyone else was, you know, moving that city in one way or another, you know, like just a, a lot of what to speak of yoga teachers, you know. Oh, and okay. and it was a place that was had a strong kind of yoga tradition happening there. The teacher was Eddie Stern, a close friend of mine. I believe you've met Eddie. He's come to the Eco Village mm. uh, not so long ago. And... Um, and so there was an interest in going deeper into the tradition of yoga there, more so than I think in far more so than in, in your average yoga center. And I was walking in there with now 15 years or so of experience in that world. Um, okay. But I was, you know, 
but this is this is the thing. I stepped out of the bubble at that point, right? I, I was even though as a brahmachari, I was always meeting with the public, uh, presenting books to the public, and so on. But now, for the first time, I was actually like living with them and even developing friendships with them, which I really wasn't doing as a monk. It, my 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 life as a monk was more cloistered in a sense, you know. Mm. And um, that was important. Uh, how seeing how our teachings and our philosophy how it appealed to these people what about it was appealing to them was important for me to understand you know mm. and um in that center i became the there was a temple in that yoga center and then eventually it was a ganesh temple and then we added a radha krishna temple and i became the temple cook and i began to teach um not asana but philosophy there and develop Are a lot you of relationships. About this at the Bhakti Center or some other temples? No, no. Now this, this Ashtanga was Ashtanga Yoga Center. Ashtanga Yoga, Ashtanga Yoga Center, which okay. eventually we called the Broom Street Temple. Okay. And and so that was a place where I really began to reconsider how to relate with people as a, a Bhakti Yoga practitioner, as a Hare Krishna devotee, how to present uh, Bhagavad Gita and Bhagavatam to people, what they found appealing about it, what was relevant about it. Because the point that you just made, you know, that, yeah, if I'm counterculture and looking for an alternative, then, yeah, those Hare Krishna people, that's definitely a, you know, a bold alternative, you know, lifestyle. But if I'm not looking for some drastic alternative lifestyle, then it could seem just very foreign and odd. Um, so seeing what it was about asana, what it was about yoga philosophy, that this wide group of influential dynamic people were interested in, that was very educational experience for me. And so the years that I spent practicing there, which was 2003 till about 2012 or so, um, I made a lot of great relationships and I had a lot of, you know, um, it was another type of training for me. You know, in a sense, you yeah. were doing in the yoga world what Tamal Krishna Maharaj was doing in the academic world. No, yeah, actually similar. Going in and uh, learning how to share rather than simply sharing. Yes. In a that's sense. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's what happened. And so therefore, I really have always um, appreciated Radha Swami's uh, instruction. I call it order. At the time, he actually ordered me. <laughs> you know, he actually used that word. But oh, in, really? as the years pass, he he does. I didn't order you. You know, <laughs> I was just a suggestion. You know, he says like that. But I embraced it as it. He actually did use the word order, and I embraced it as an order. And um, the wisdom in it, um, and the way that it's played out in my life, has been really mm -hmm. important. And then, so now that brings us to the point that that uh, that you shared that. I'm trying to remember the point now, but it was about, it had to do with um, the relevance of this in my life rather than I'm not searching for a drastic lifestyle change. Yeah. It's like adding but, value to my life versus looking yes. for alternative way of living. Yes. Right. So how does it add value to, to, to my life? So just one minute, when you're talking about yes. this downtown New York, it yes. does seem that many of the people were a part of the, you could call it the mainstream society or at least not a part of the fringe of society, because you're talking about musicians, writers, and so yoga is practiced, I would say, quite a lot by the mainstream and the upper crust of society, isn't it? It's not like counterculture. So what was the demographic that you were reaching in that uh, in that place? It, well, it was a unique group of people because, um, like I say, uh, you see, it was a, a unique yoga center because it had had a sh because of the teacher Eddie Stern it had a very strong traditional feel to it. Okay. And so people that had an interest in that um, naturally ended up there. Hmm. Um, and but also he became uh, he was known as a quality teacher, and there wasn't yoga wasn't nearly as widespread at that point as it is now. So there were less alternatives of where to go. And if you started inquiring, where can I find a really good yoga teacher? A lot of people got turned on to him. And a lot of those people were actually, you know, there, amongst them were like celebrities, like, you know, people oh. like Madonna and people like, you know, some of the most famous musicians in the world and some of the, 
you know, like I'm saying, people that are writing for the New York Times, you know, people that are, um, you know, making movies, you know, that are well respected, um, you know, people that are, um, you know, just all different varieties of people that were dynamic, you know, because that's what New York City offers in one sense. You, you, a lot of those people are gathered there. And mm. so this this particular center really had a, you know, a lot of dynamic people there. So you could say, in one sense, the whole thing was a little bit counterculture because yoga wasn't as well known and this studio wasn't advertised and, and everything. But these were people that were known in society, you know, in one way or another. Okay. So in one sense, we cannot even homogenize the yoga scene because that yeah. will also be dependent on the particular teacher, the particular place. And yes. yoga also will be quite diverse. Yes. Yeah, makes sense. So okay. then when you, you are bringing this point that you were asking what from our culture, our philosophy will speak to these people. So you yeah. were asking that question. So what, what was the answer that you came up with? Or well, it was, a, as I tell you, it's an answer that gradually reveals itself. You know, it, it's, it's not like um, you finally get the answer and then you just change everything. But it's something that I, I this is the way that I view it, is that how to reach more and more people is something that when devotees get together uh, and they served in the right mood, with the right desire, with the right guidance, and with mm. patience, you know, Krishna reveals what we're meant to do next, what we're meant to do next. And I saw that at the Bhakti Center. You know, that's what I really saw at the Bhakti Center, that in one sense, um, Radha Swami was always ahead of everyone in, in, in really, in, in the terms of the the instructions that he was giving, but it, it takes us a while to really understand the essence of it or how to apply that essence. And step by step, like, it feels like when you are serving, when a group of people comes together and serves, puts aside egos, puts aside agendas, uh, takes shelter of of more advanced devotees and, and, and is ready to, to sacrifice and be patient, that it feels like, then Krishna reveals step by step what to do. And and when he reveals it, it almost feels like, oh, that was obvious. Why didn't we realize it before? You know, so um, I would say that, you know, what what some of the things that, that I began to understand through years of serving with the Bhakti Center was that um, one, that people's minds have been changed. And when I say their minds, I mean like the, the state of their minds or the the ability of their minds that if you go back to the 60s and the 70s you're really living in a very different world and by the time like say where we are now you know 2021 where you know there's three decades of personal computers use right there's the one and a half decades of social media consumption and you know involvement and um, I think those things have really sh shaped people's minds or their, their ability to think in certain ways, you know? Um, it's, it's affected them mentally, it's affected them emotionally. And uh, it's it creates, you know, you need to respond to that. You, you need to recognize and respond to that. So for instance, here, here's an idea that like, I give a book to someone in 1970, and they have a particular mind that's been developed by how they've been raised and how they've grown up and so on. They take that book, they have an interest in book in the, in the book, and they have an interest in reading in general, and they have an interest in philosophy, and they read the book and they're moved by it, and they decide they want to learn more. And now in this day and age, you give a book to a person and they look at the pictures of it and then they set it aside and never read it, <laughs> so, you know, because their minds, their their attention spans are so short, it's just even hard for them. So now how do you get a person to read that book? And like in the Bhakti Center, you know, of, you know, gradually, you know, we developed, um, you know, one, one of the devotees are Rasika Gopi, you know, she, she um, began doing these reading groups. You know, it's not that other people weren't having reading groups, but as devotees, we never really had reading groups. You know, if you want to come in and learn Bhagavad Gita, you walk into a Sunday feast lecture and someone lectures on sort of on Bhagavad Gita and then you walk mm -hmm. away. Um, and uh, here was an idea like, oh, I could get together with a supportive group, <laughs> right? And make some friendships. I, I want friendships. 
and I, and I need, and, and, and if I don't have a supportive group, I'm never going to even finish this book. But because I joined the group, I feel a certain social support that, that makes me, when the evening rolls around after a long day of work, I pick up the book rather than turn on the television because I know tomorrow I'm going to be at the meeting and I won't even have anything to say if I don't read. But And I want to read and I want to have something to say. So by being in that reading group, I'm actually going to work my way through that book, open my mind to it, hear other people's um, I, thoughts on it in the group, be able to present my questions in that group, mm. uh, have them answered in a, in a sympathetic way <laughs> in that group. You know, these are needs that, um, that I think people really have nowadays um, that were less pressing, say, in 1970 as there are in 2020. You know, so I think, you know, step by step, uh, how to, you know, what people need to, to practice was kind of um, being revealed to us at the Bhakti Center, you know, and, and I want to say it's not the only way or, you know, people can, you know, I respect people that are presenting Bhakti in, in, in so many ways, but this is the way that we kind of began to present and began to understand things. And um, so I, I think there, there, there are certain, you know, we need to recognize that people's minds have been weakened in a way through computers and through social media. I think that's just a fact, you know? It's mm. just a cultural, social fact. Um, I think people are working longer hours than they had in the past, you know? Their, their jobs are more demanding. Their jobs continue even after they go home because of email and texting and, and so on. So people, their time is shorter. You know, they, they don't have as much freedom of time. I think we need to recognize that, you know. Um, I think, you know, um, mm. I think that people's minds are, um, there's a certain, well, l let me say this. Let's move on now from Bhakti Center and some of the things that we discovered there. And by the way, like there, I'd say some of the most important lessons that we learned were the need for hospitality in a center like that. Okay, right. just one minute, if you don't mind. I would yes. just like to respond to this. You know, the way social media has sure. changed things. You know, it struck me also, because say, I became a brahmachari in 96. Mm -hmm. And I was introduced in 96. I became a brahmachari in 98. And literally, I don't think... Uh, I read a newspaper till 2010. Hmm? Hmm. The only time oh, I read oh, in it those was, years as a brahmachari. As a brahmachari, right. so the only time I read it was somebody brought it after 9/11. There was a big disaster, and somebody had brought a newspaper to the temple, and I read it. Yeah. So I was completely out of the, you could say, the social loop. Not that I read newspapers extensively now, but I was completely like on a different planet during that time. And then we were doing our outreach. I was primarily involved in college programs. But then slowly, as the internet started moving forward, you know, distraction was one thing that struck me. But there's another thing that struck me, and it became even more evident when I started traveling to the West, that people's level as well as capacity of skepticism has increased. Mm -hmm. If I, as a speaker, make a statement, I remember one of my friends, he gave a talk. And at the end, it, it, is like a, it is a talk in America. He had come from India with the Indian didactic way of teaching. And he gave a talk to a university in America. And after that, one boy, he said, you know, during your talk, I was Googling, you made 33 factual mistakes in your talk. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe that was a bit provoked too for extreme. But the, but the point is, there is also... Yeah. Uh, not just a rebellious rejection of authority, but people have more resources available to question authority. And if we are not mm -hmm. used to that, we are not, if we are not used to that, that kind of uh, audience, then it can, it can become very acrimonious. So I felt right. that you know, the, the, the vertical way of speaking and the more horizontal way of speaking I find that in the Bhakti Center and most of the devotees that I have seen, like even Radhanath Maharaj, I would say he has evolved. Like he may have used the word instruction, but now he's saying suggestion. So, yeah, right. so I also had that. So I would say that is one thing also that the, the, the audience has changed in the sense that we cannot be that vertical in our presentation. 
Well, and we, this, yeah, please I'm sorry, ahead. please continue. Yeah. No, so I feel that this was, even now this strikes me, say, when I am speaking in India and when I'm speaking in America, the it's not just the way I naturally, my speak, I, I don't try to be too vertical anytime, but the way audience deals with me and the way audience uh, deals with me in the Western world, there's, there's a radical difference in the two. And uh, unless, uh, I think I think that's a major, major difference between the world, uh, between the world maybe 20, 30 years ago and now. What do you think? 100%. And that was exactly the point that I was actually working towards, but you just expressed oh, really? it so well. Yeah, the way that you said it, um, the horizontal rather than vertical, I was going to say, Condescension uh, is a huge block, <laughs> right? Like, in other words, I'll say this: you know, you say that there's that there's a difference in India and um, in 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 the United States with that. Do you, do you find India moving in that direction, where you need to speak more vertically than horizontal, or more horizontally than vertically, or still you can speak? Yeah. Pretty no, I would vertically. say that it again depends. You know, India is a huge country. And the Hindi speaking audience is one, yeah. the English speaking audience is different. So I would say the way I speak in India, in Mumbai, even any preachers also, the way we speak in Mumbai would be different from say, the way they might speak in some smaller town in the heartland of India. Sure. So, so definitely gotcha. there's a change. Right. I uh, It's yeah. moving toward that direction. And yeah. in many ways in India, although our movement is uh, spreading in significant ways, we are not really reaching the the opinion leaders of society, the culture shapers of society. Right. We could say we are we are reaching uh, people who already have a certain level of piety and receptivity. And this is not a criticism, this is just an observation. Yeah, I got so you. in that sense, even now to some extent, the horizontal approach, the vertical approach will work. But even the existence of something like a Govardhan Eco Village, where people can come and be themselves. They don't have to have that reverence of being in a temple. You know, they can yeah. go to a, go for a walk. They can go see, be with uh, be with animals. They can go on a trek. So yeah. that itself is a forum, I would say, for helping people to connect with spirituality, the spiritual environment at a horizontal level rather than a vertical level. You, okay, this is where your engineering mind <laughs> is so helpful, right? You you should have someone design a video that's showing this. That that's right. Like, is when we're coming on this vertical, it's it's going to reach a certain amount of people. But when you turn it horizontally, it's going to open you up to a much wider field, and um, yeah. that I feel is a very crucial, crucial um, concept for anyone trying to present bhakti in the Western world. Um, the, you know, one thing that Raghunath and I have really, really become crystallized in our minds through the Wisdom of the Sages podcast. Mm -hmm. um, and if you would have said to us uh, two years ago that we, you know, there would be like thousands of people every day listening to Bhagavatam coming from all different backgrounds, who it would have been surprising to us. Um, I think one of the reasons why it, it's it's able to reach people and connect with people and interest people is the is the idea that we're not trying to present ourselves as gurus as highly enlightened people um we're we we kind of can understand ourselves and try to present ourselves as we're like you we're people in this world that are struggling. We're struggling with our minds. We're struggling with our senses. We're struggling with our families. We're struggling with our jobs. We're struggling with all the things that you, you know. We're just we're just like you. What we do have is is you know, three decades of of training and study and and experience in in bhakti yoga, and this changes our lives, and so we're people just like you. And if you hear about this, it might change your life too. It might enrich your life in a similar way. That that um, level of communication, I think, has potential to just go very, very wide. And I think the uh, you know, let's say ISKCON in the Western world, you know, if you go back two decades or something like that, it's I don't think that was so necessarily so widely understood. And um, 
more or less, you know, we had a picture of Srila Prabhupada. Okay, you sit on the elevated seats, you get the garland, you, you and then you pontificate from that platform. And it is, it is, you know, even without a negative con connotation, but it is condescension, right? It is, I'm more enlightened than you. I have a superior understanding, you know, of of life and truth than you. I'm going to present it to you now, you know. It, that whether it's an emotion, you know, I'm sure it's largely an emotional thing, but even just on the practical level for that person to understand that this person has something relevant to share in my life, uh, it doesn't get communicated nearly as well. And, and all the imagery that goes with that, whether it be, it, it might be how I dress or how I carry myself or the, the, the subtleties in the language that I use, the attitude in which I answer a question Mm. Uh, people feel that and they pick up on that and they feel uh, my observation is that people feel comfortable and open when you present yourself as hey you know that's a great question it's a question that I ask myself a lot too I don't claim to be the big guru here but this is when I look at the Bhagavad Gita it says this and when I've applied in my life like this it's it's worked in this way and it's it's been helpful for me when you communicate with people on that horizontal kind of platform, they're they're much more open, and 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 what you're presenting feels much more relevant to them. And then let them, if they want to see you as in some way as superior, and you know, in some way as having more to offer, then then that has to develop organically. It can't be assumed or claimed without it being earned. Mm. Beautifully put, you know. So there is, uh, in India, if you are a spiritual teacher, there is an assumption of authority that you can assume that you have a certain level of authority. Yeah. And I read something interesting about, uh, say, the psychology of the counterculture and how so many gurus were successful at that time. So one thing which struck me, it seems that even when there is a rebellion, people don't lose the basics of their upbringing. So what happens is that they may re reject one authority, but then once they, if they find a truly trustworthy authority, then they can accept that authority with the, with the same or even greater submission than the kind of authority they had in their life previously. Mm -hmm. So we could say in the 50s, 60s, everybody grew up in a more vertical culture. Yeah. And although they rejected one vertical aspect, they could expect uh, accept another vertical aspect when they found uh, one with integrity, like they found Shila Prabhupada. Yeah. In the seventies, but in the in the two thousands, people have not grown with any authority at all. Yeah. Suddenly, when they come to to a, a spiritual tradition, they expect to accept authority. It doesn't work. You know, I I think that's you you you, you summed it up very well there, and, and you know I would like to share this too, is that for this to really work, you know, in other words, to reach people on that horizontal level. It's not merely a mental adjustment or an adjustment in presentation, but it's also like you really do have to conceive of yourself that way too. You know, like you really have to develop genuine friendships. You really have to, um, you, you really have to adopt an attitude that, yeah, I'm fallen. <laughs> you know, devotees, we think that if, if, if we, we have to present ourselves as unfallen, for people to hear from us. But really people want to hear from someone that's fall, <laughs> from fallen and dealing with the same struggles that they're dealing with. And so when when you come through with that attitude in a real genuine way, I think it opens up the doors. And, and that, you know, another thing that, that uh, Roganath and I have really seen and felt um, through our experience with Wisdom of the Sages is like, you know, suddenly we had, you know, 5,000, 6,000, 7,000 people listening to this Bhagavatam presentation every day. And we're trying to understand who are they and why are they here and you know how, why are they listening? And um, we've, we've found that there's a lot of parallels. A lot of the people that were listening were, um, had experience with 12-step programs. And um, which quite, the, quite, you know, the fact is, is just a lot of people in the world, you know, have experience with 12-step programs at this point. Mm -hmm. And um, they somehow were appreciative of the way that things were presented. 
And um, I think that w- what's there in the 12-step programs, we can learn a lot from. Again, that idea of it being horizontal rather than, you know, every speaker gets up and says, I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> you know, My name is this and I'm an alcoholic. Um, rather than some person that's not an alcoholic getting up there and telling him one, you know, it, what the truth is. It's coming from a place of, of um, a, a more horizontal place. And uh, the idea of having group support as well, th- that, that both of these ideas are really essential in reach, reaching a wider audience. For someone to, to step up and say, hi, my name is Kastuba, and I'm also a fallen conditioned soul. You know, I don't have to try to present myself as anything else. And you know, I have my struggles in life too. Um, I, I'm even want, willing to share them with you. And this is how I apply the teachings of bhakti to it. That that's that that's a way that people's ears will start to open up more. And then to pro, to be to be there for them, the mood of mentorship that's there in the twelve step programs and the mood of group support. I think those are things that that are helpful and that that give people the chance to actually um, mm-hmm. practice this regularly. So you are talking about the twelve steps. Yeah. You know, so a lot of people can connect with that. So this is very, uh, I mean, maybe we can move from the, you talked about Bhakti Center and you came to the wisdom of the sages. I think it happened organically. Yeah. But when you're talking about this, I have been reading a lot about Bhakti Vinod Thakur. And okay. in the Bhakti Vinod Thakur was not exactly a institutional person. But I read that at that time, through his regular magazines, he like cultivated a virtual community in Bengal through his magazine mm-hmm. articles and through his publications. Not that he actually met people, he would meet them, but he had a job, he had a family, he couldn't travel. But it was just through his writing, he was cultivating. And he was actually cultivated, able to, able to uh, connect with a good number of people who were quite thoughtful. The Bhadra Loka was his primary audience. And if you read Bhaktivinoda Thakur's writings also, you know, they are not that vertical. It's quite horizontal. He'll, like, he'll use some story, some novel, novel format to like seep in teaching rather than just instruct. So in one sense, I would say what you're doing in the wisdom of the sages, it is actually very much grounded in the in our tradition. So uh, thank you for sharing that. That's uh, encouraging. <laughs> amazing. So, so this 12 steps, uh, uh, are you means actually reformulating bhakti in the form of 12 steps or you're basically providing some similar uh, similar support groups? Well, we, we actually do have um, like uh, recovery groups that are, um, that, that the Bhakti Center, has, I'm sorry, that the Wisdom of the Sages has started. So six, six times a week uh, online, we have uh, bhakti recovery meetings that are based on 12 step, that are you know, led by people with, years of experience in 12-step programs. So that's there for sure. Uh, but I was speaking in a more general sense. Okay. That just, yeah, that just um, some of the ideas that you have there in 12-step, whereas it's not like there's the the person that comes in and pontificates, but it's like people sharing, oh, I'm on you, yeah. I'm like you, I struggle like you do. Uh, here's how I apply this in my life. I need it every day. If I don't get it, I'm in trouble. Um, I need you and I need all of you in my life and let's, you know, let's, um, let's work on this together. That that's like real essential. And, um, it, it, not that that's necessarily even done in a formal way, but that mm. it's, that there's a, that, that, that there's a mood, but you know, I'll, I'll say this too. And, and that is, uh, I think small groups and that that's, again, I think something that was there in Bhattimino Thakur, how he is outreach in Bengal and so on. Um, that it involves small group meetings and things like that. I think those are real important places that, that if, if I were to say that there's one aspect, like we say, that, you know, that my guru mentioned that the temples weren't so effective. In my mind, if, if I had to pinpoint it on one, you know, what's one point that, that's that the, a reason for that, you know, it might be that I could walk into, you know, a lot of ISKCON temples, you know, and go there every Sunday because that's like the big public program and go there for 10 years and never really feel like I can fully express my doubts or my 
fears or my confusions or something like that. You know, I go and someone gives a class, I may not feel comfortable speaking up. I may not have the time or the space to really articulate where I'm at or, or why I'm you know, struggling. I might not develop real close friendships. And so, and so groups really help um, address those problems that I'm gonna meet people, I'm gonna get to know them, you know, I'm, I'm going to be able to express exactly what's on my mind in, in knowing that I'm doing it where I'm not going to be judged for that. Mm-hmm. You know, that's, that's the kind of stuff that's there in 12 step programs that I think, you know, our temples need. If I come to your place, I have a bunch of questions and I need to be able to sit down and talk with people about it. I need to be able to express where I'm at, not feel judged for it and, and, um, and feel I have some support there. You know, I think those are all real important. You know, as you're thinking, it struck me that our ESCON's educational format, and which we could say in some way draws from the traditional way things were taught, it is more for education for people who have already various connections with the community, with the spiritual center, and you're already a part of the culture and you get some further education. But what you are mm-hmm. talking about is the educational forum is the way for connection and that it's a, it's a different way of envisioning it itself so yeah. there are yeah. people who do not have so say the temple bhagavatam class or the brahmachari class or the even gita class as was there if the people are already staying in the temple or staying nearby they already have connections and this is just to learn more but yeah. what we are talking about is to connect more yeah and yeah, both uh, have to be there I, I won't even learn because I don't have the, I don't even have the peace of mind to sit down and, and read a book from end to end. I need group support even just to learn, <laughs> right? But oh. but I need more than just learning too. I need the group support, uh, emotionally, oh. to 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 or to even to dig down into the real issues of why I'm not fully giving my mind and my heart to this. You know, to advance in bhakti, it means ultimately I have to fully give my 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 heart. And unless I can really, you know. Raghunath and I, we answer questions every Saturday on Wisdom of the Sages. We People write in their questions and we answer them. And we're getting questions, you know, that people wouldn't ask in the middle of a Sunday feast talk, you know? You know, I'm, you know, th- th- this is my situation. You know, my husband or my wife isn't a devotee. Or when I go to work, this is the circumstance. Or, you know, my, my people in my home eat meat. Or what do I need to completely refrain from sex in order to practice this, you know? or I want to refrain from sex, but I don't know if my husband's ready for that. You know, like these are real questions, you know, real important questions that people need to have answered if they're going to be able to practice this. And they need a form where they can do that and feel free to do that. Uh, again, without feeling judged for it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's almost like uh, to put it in more of our traditional categories of knowledge. You know, we have Samandha Gyan, we emphasize it a lot. You're not the body or the soul. And we talk about Prayojan. We all want to become pure devotees of Krishna. But the mm-hmm. Abhideya, we reduce it to a very simplistic following of rules. Mm-hmm. But how to go about the challenges when we are trying to follow the Abhideya, we are not so real about that. And what I can mm-hmm. see is that that's what you are trying to do. So, it's most of our classes are, you know, how to improve how to improve your practices of bhakti or how to improve your uh, improve your understanding of the philosophy which is good but yeah. you know i have to live a life and how does my bhakti practice interact with the rest of my life and how do i deal with the challenges yeah thank you yeah yeah you, you know and another thing that i'll share and i think it's related to this but um we need to recognize what aspects of our culture and our philosophy are relevant or are attractive to people? Um, for instance, if I were to say to someone, um, God is a person, right? And you can shake his hand and you could know him and, and your the goal of life is to serve him. That's going to narrow down, you know, just like that presentation right there is the, I'm going to find a narrow audience that's going to be receptive to that. Now, if I were to say uh, that in the East and from this yoga, ancient yoga tradition, there's a conception of God uh, in three different aspects. 
that there's an all-pervasive aspect of God, that there's an, there's an aspect of God within the heart of every living being. And then there's also a personal aspect of God. That, just that message is much easier and, more, and far more intriguing. It, it feels mature. It feels like there's something, I, oh, you've opened up my mind to something that I, I've never thought of it that way. I, I want to go deeper into that. And if I just say God's a person, you have to, you know, then that's like, I'm not interested, not so interested in that message, you know? So that's, you know, that, on the, that, that, how we present the same exact books, but how we present them, it, you know, becomes real important. Mm. Or, or for instance, concepts like this, concepts like, well, what, what am I going to get from reading your Bhagavad Gita? Well, you learn Krishna is God and that you surrender to Krishna and that that's the purpose of life that's not going to be such a, you're not going to find such a receptive audience to that. But if you mm. can say that the Bhagavad Gita teaches how to become a wise person, you know, how we can move through this world. And even though it's constantly changing, that there's a spiritual truth that, that, that because I'm made of spiritual energy, I never change. And, and, and I can learn through wisdom with knowledge of the law of karma, with knowledge of the influence of time, with the knowledge of how the gunas work, I can begin to see this world through different eyes. And the same things that would have disturbed me or upset me or, or tortured me previously, I can move through this world happy and content with an even mind all the time. That's what the Bhagavad Gita teaches. Oh, well, that's something I can use, right? And then what to speak of. And then from that platform, I'll be able to understand the point and the purpose of my life. You know, and go deeper into real, true spirituality. Oh, that I want to know about. That's relevant to me. So I, I think we, we need to look at books like the Bhagavad Gita and see that everything people want is there. We just haven't always been, you know, really clear in understanding what it is, you know, how, how they can understand it and accept it and be intrigued by it or be interested in it. Beautiful. Again, going back to this point, what I mean, the way you spoke about these two things, I would like to just flesh it out a bit. So rather okay. than, again, that exa conception of God, rather than mm -hmm. giving like a vertical, it's more horizontal. There are three aspects. Oh, that means, you know, I can connect with, I can, what what do I, what can I relate with? I have options. It's yeah. not that the truth is like cut and dry and either you accept it or you, you, you have no place over here. So that is gels with that vertical, horizontal yes. dynamic. And this aspect of, uh, I, you know, in many ways, I present the Gita in this way, but I didn't think of articulating it this way that, uh, that while we talk about the concept of Sthita Pragya, to stay equipoised, but rather than saying that we should stay equipoised, we talk about how the Bhagavad Gita helps us to ground ourselves in the unchanging part within us and then not be so disturbed by the world's ups and downs. So, in a sense, again, it goes back to adding value to my life If I, instead of an alternative way of living. Yes, there is a God and you can love God and you can be happy with Him in, the, in His world. In That's another like a world, different, yeah. It's a different way of living. Yeah. So, you know, this is... A, you talked about the parts of our philosophy which are, which are relevant or attractive. So, how do you present... A, some of the more vertical or demanding parts, say like uh, the regulative principles or a commitment to a particular level of chanting or even initiation requiring a precondition of doing some things. So yeah. do you see those definitions of success as relevant in the contemporary scene? And, you know, how do we measure our outreach? Or oh, so many people became initiated or so many, how, how, do, how do you see all that now? Well, yeah, I think all of those things can be explained in ways that are that 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 will make sense to people, and that, and that will even um, make them more interested. But I do think we do have to be careful about those measures of success. Um, that we, I don't know, that we don't make them the prerequisites to be involved regularly <laughs> with us, right? But but like, let's take initiation, okay. Uh, w what we're presenting is that it's like this. Um, what's presented in these ancient yogic texts, and 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 I'll just to begin the, the answer, I would say that this is where this is where like my years of entering into that yoga world they were really helpful for me, 
Because when we explain our things, not so much in terms of like, let's say faith or religion, but in terms of yoga and, and, and more like the science of how the mind works, that's far more appealing to a wider audience. Mm. So if I say what, what we're presenting is it, what's been presented for thousands of years is that there's material energy and there's spiritual energy, right? Mm. We're composed of spiritual energy. We have a mind and body that's composed of material energy. And the mind is very much like a computer that's been programmed with different ideas of what's going to make me happy. Mm. And I've become a slave to those ideas and that's what's causing me all my anxiety. Okay, that's an interesting presentation and we can go into further depth on that. So how do we counter that? Now, the, an incredibly super powerful way to counter that is by bringing the mind to spiritual energy. And the, the great teachers in this tradition have identified places where that spiritual energy is very vibrant and potent. One of them is in these mantras, right? One of them is in books like th these sacred texts. You know, that these are not ordinary, but these have very powerful, deep spiritual effect. So the point is that if I can expose my mind daily, right, every day, rather than expose it to the junk food of television and Netflix and, and these other things, which I'm habituated to do and which haven't elevated my consciousness, if I expose myself to these powerful, potent spiritual um, substances, that my mind will become spiritualized by it, just like putting an iron rod into a fire. Okay, so still, what's the need for initiation? Why can't I just chant that mantra and be free? Well, because for that, for you to receive the power and the, the full benefit of that um, potent mantra, it, it's, it's, it's not just like saying, you know, um, if I have a disease, just give me the medicine and I'll be done. No, you need a doctor that's going to help you understand how that the diet that you need, the, the amount of rest that you'll need in order for that medicine to fully take effect. And that's gonna be different with every person. That's why we need a, a personal doctor that understands our particular symptoms and that can give us the proper dosage, the proper medicine, the proper dosage, the, the, the proper diet, the proper lifestyle. And so that is what initiation is about. Initiation is being initiated into the mantra but if I'm not living the right lifestyle, if I haven't developed the right sentiments, if I'm coming to it with the misconceptions, then it's kind of like I'm not, I, I haven't opened myself up to full res receptivity of the mm. power of that medicine. And so therefore regulative principles, right? If I'm not living compassionately, mm. I won't develop the kind of spiritual compassion that I need to fully connect with that mantra. You know, even, even from a yoga point of view, to focus my mind and absorb my mind. It's the idea is like, I want to take my mind and absorb it in that mantra, not just like splash a little mantra on it, but I need to absorb my mind in it. And that's what a yogi does. That's what yoga is. It means I can focus and concentrate my mind on one point. And so I need the lifestyle to do that. I need someone to help me understand, hey, you got your mind caught up in all kinds of petty things, petty arguments, petty attachments, you need to let go of them so that when you sit down to absorb your mind in this, it won't be distracted. So that's what a guru or a spiritual teacher is meant to help a person do. That's when it require the right lifestyle. So we're going to require, you know, um, um, you know, the right sentiments and, and the right knowledge. And so that's what that spiritual teacher is going to help you with so that you can fully derive the benefit from these powerful sources of spiritual energy. So it's something, you know, when you're speaking like that, it sounds so much more rational, you know, than just saying, you know, well, this is a mystic thing and the mystic person accepts you into the mystic lineage and something mystic happens, you know. Okay. Yeah, so it's like at one level you have a social connect with people at a personal level and at another level we have a rational explanation of things. And I think in India also, if we are to reach to educated people, we do need that rational presentation. Without that, things don't uh, make sense. Of course, the specifics of that rationality will be different. The kind mm -hmm. of questions people may have will be different. But uh, the principle is same. And uh, now about the, the Wisdom of the Sages podcast. So you are taking directly the Bhagavatam. Isn't that a little bit advanced book or I mean, how did you choose to take the Bhagavatam per se, say not the Bhagavad Gita, or not the 
yoga sutras or something like that and i saw your classes you know you don't avoid difficult issues you take yeah. the verses and you you i you are able to uh you are able to present provocative topics non provocatively <laughs> <laughs> thank you R- ragada is a is a huge help with that too um the way that it happened was kind of spontaneous the way that the the podcast began was um last year well no now it's two years ago right not not last year but the year before um in i i um it was in about march of that year that i just kind of became inspired by um by sheshaka prabhu to read bhagavatam daily which i hadn't been doing and uh, it's a fact that you know most of us you know we just we you know initiated devotees we own a set of bhagavatam but we just kind of let it sit there collecting dust you know mm. uh, so i um i calculated that if i read 80 verses of bhagavatam a day and you know dipped in to purports here or there but just kind of read the verses um that in that that didn't take so long that took about some like 40 to 50 minutes a day something like that that within a year no within 6 months i could read the entire bhagavatam um so I, myself and my wife were reading bhagavatam every day and just really feeling incredible enlightenment you know an incredible inspiration from it um uh and realizing that this is the instruction all along <laughs> that actually we're meant to hear bhagavatam right like that's that's panchang javakti here hearing bhagavatam and as you read bhagavatam it's telling you again and again the value of hearing bhagavatam um so i was getting inspired like that and then ragana said you know i have a few students that want to do something every morning and you know and i'm thinking of doing something you know online with them and uh i'm wondering what i should do and i suggested why don't you read bhagavatam with them every day so he he began doing that and his group grew from like you know five people to 15 people to 25 people over a series of months now you had 25 people are tuning in at 5 a.m. on zoom to be to to hear bhagavatam to hear him discuss it and then he began to bring me in as a occasional kind of like um commentator and then by september so that month i became like a regular almost like a co-host and the group was growing and growing to about 80 people then by like no october november mm. of uh 2019 and then we said okay let's launch this officially and we launched it officially as a podcast just a year ago on january 1st last year so the idea of bhagavatam it wasn't like it was a plan to reach thousands and thousands of people as some kind of strategy it was just that's where the juice was coming from that's where the nectar was coming from that's where the inspiration was coming from mm. uh but we did find that we were being challenged to present it to people that were less familiar with it uh but we found that it was very relevant in their lives mm. um you know and, and this is this is one point um that really became clear to me and this was really important for me in the development of my own spiritual life and that is this is that we were reach you know i think a lot of times iskan was trying to reach a young audience like you try to you college age or something like that and and our listeners were like i i would say 40 years old might be the median age you know for our wisdom the sages listeners and these were people that had that didn't live as a monk and didn't have decades of training and so on uh in, in yoga or in bhakti um but they had life experience they had been married maybe divorced they had had kids and had the joys of raising kids but also had the anxieties and the pains and the tragedies and the disappointments they had addictions they had you know started businesses they were working in places that they that were challenging with people that are challenging they wanted something higher something spiritual something real something beauty and compassion and 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 spirituality and they're looking for it um now but they didn't have the background in it now my i i think not intentionally but just kind of um the way that things just played out in my own training and you know as a monk in iskan is that almost 
it's hard not to develop an idea that, um, well, you've kind of been wasting your life in the material world. And I've spent years, you know, training myself in the spiritual world. Um, so I'm way, way, way ahead of you, <laughs> you know? And, um, but what I found was that, what we found was that when you take that life experience um, and where it can bring a person, then when you add the Krishna Bhakti philosophy to that, almost immediately the person's level of faith and acceptance um, can take off on a very high level, you know? So I, I, I might not have had, you know, um, so many years of training and the philosophy and so on, but I got to a point in my life where I was just like, I just want God. I realized that this material life is, is um, troublesome and painful and I really want the truth and I really want spirituality. Once that, that, that soil is that fertile, that when you plant the seed in that, it, it sprouts very quickly, you know? Th that's been my realization. So, um, and, 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 that, and it might not even grow as strong as someone who's living in the ashram, but without all the life experience and without all of the, you know, if I haven't experienced all that, I might not be as um, eager and, and as humble, you know, as, um, as someone who's gone through all that. Awfully put. Hmm. You know, uh, I just, uh, recently my brother, I have almost a 13 year gap between me and my brother. And he had a baby, his first child. So mm -hmm. I can see him changing as a person, you know, just going through that life experience makes him a different person. Yeah. So, you know, sometimes we just discount all of material life as entangling and illusory, but people evolve through material life. And if at that time, so many things about, he's not a devotee, he's favorable, but you know, I can see now that he's become a parent, his paradigm has changed. He's concerned about, yeah. say, how I will raise my child properly. What values am I going to give to my child? And there are opportunities for sharing spiritual wisdom based on where people are at in their life experience. Yeah. And if we just like, again, homogenize their life experience as mundane and illusory and uh, entangling, then we lose that opportunity. Right. So, so it's yeah, interesting. Exactly. Yeah, it's interesting that the demographic of the age of 40, that's the time when people start uh, to some extent re-questioning their life. Some people get into exactly. midlife crisis. And exactly. I don't think we have tapped that demographic at all. In, it's, it's, it seems to me like the best, demogra <laughs> the best demographic. <laughs> In fact, and, I would say, sorry to put it a little differently. You yeah. know, we tap people when they are at 50, 20 or 25. And then their midlife crisis, they start reevaluating their spiritual life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it can be like that. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> true. True. Yes. So, so it was it was eye opening for us. And then when you take, get to your original question, you know, well, Bhagavatam is that is it too advanced or is it relevant? Mm. Um, yeah, Bhak, you know, Bhagavatam is advanced, but it's also you know, it's it's all these cantos preparing us for what's really advanced too, right? So it's like, you can take even the most far out wild stuff in the Bhagavatam, like you take, um, you know, like Sati going to her, it's going to, um, you know, her father's social sacrifice and um, being insulted. And then the whole thing breaks into a chaotic scene. And But like, you'll find everywhere that there's real practical life lessons there, you know, in mm. terms of Daksha's mindset in terms of uh, Sati's mindset, in terms of, you know, how um, Brahma ultimately instructs everyone, mm -hmm. you know, and then eventually the prayers that everyone offers to Lord Vishnu in the end, you know, like there's real powerful life lessons throughout the entire thing. You know, we were, w w this morning, you know, just an hour and a half ago or some, Raghunath and I were, we were doing a recap of the first canto because we covered the first and second cantos in the first year. So the first few days of this year, we're recapping. Mm. And just looking at today, we're talking about uh, the cursing of Maharaj Parikit and um, the way that he responded, the way that um, that Shamika Rishi responded, 
the way that Shringy responded. There's just, there's such, just a wealth of like takeaways that someone could put in their own life, you know, that at work, in my family life, that are right there. They're real genuine, you know, how, how um, the, the punishment wasn't right. You know, it was too much, but Maharaj Prickett accepted it. How um, Shamiku Rishi was insulted, but he, 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 he didn't accept it as an insult. He only saw the good that was there in Maharaj Prickett. And the, 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 he saw the insult as being very insignificant. Most people would see the insult as being very significant. He saw the ins insult as almost nothing. And all he saw was the genuine qualities, you know, the, the, the high qualities, you know, in where Shringi was immature as a spiritualist. He had power, but he didn't have deep spiritual realization. So he took something that was very small, he made it into something very big, you know, and, 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 and his response was ultimately destructive. You know, so like Bhagavatam is loaded with practical takeaways for life. And I think that's what we're, we're trying to focus on is give people, you know, read Bhagavatam, engage our mind in it so that we're purified every day on a daily basis, but also give people practical takeaways, uh, try to package those, try to draw a circle around them and, and someone can walk away saying, oh, I'm going to think about that today. I'm going to try to apply that today. I'm going to share that with someone today. That's what we try to do. That's beautiful. You know, uh, I have been studying the epics, the Ramayana and the Mahabharat more. And I've written one book on the Ramayana yeah. and I'm writing further. So there I, I focus more on human lessons from the epics rather than only devotional lessons. Mm -hmm. And I find that opens the reach much, much more. And in a mm -hmm. sense, you are doing that with the Bhagavatam. And while those lessons are there, but quite often they are not emphasized. So, and again, what happens is, if a spiritual text is a source of human values and human wisdom, then people's connection and appreciation for that text increases. And then when it starts teaching a direct devotional wisdom also, there is a groundwork that is created. Otherwise, if we just present spiritual wisdom and uh, devotional lessons, then it doesn't connect with people's life so much. So mm -hmm. only recently I started viewing the Bhagavatam through this lens and I'm realizing even in Krishna Leela there are so many human lessons we can give. We don't want to reduce Krishna Leela down to the mundane level but what I see is that it's like uh, we're building a ladder. We can connect mm. with Krishna Leela at different levels and uh, so what you're doing is uh, I would say you know I, I used to read the Bhagavatam before Bhagavatam stories were familiar with us, bringing up in India, Bhagavatam or Mahabharata, Ramayana. But yeah. um, it was in the classes of Radhanath Maharaj that I started uh, look, finding these human values, not just devotional values. And in a sense, now you are doing it in a more extensive way. And uh, especially if you are interacting with people, and then it's yeah. uh, then I can see that you're then. You know, you can actually know what the need of the people is also. And then the part of the Bhagavatam, which is relevant, will sort of jump out to you. I like your metaphor of drawing circles around points or making packages. Mm -hmm. that's, that's very attractive. Well, you are an expert at it, Prabhu. And I'd love to hear this. And I'm, I'm eager to read your books now. You know, um, yeah, it, it's, you know, um, Vyasadeva was instructed by Narada to more directly glorify Krishna. Hmm. But he didn't give a book like like he could have given a book like um like say one of these esoteric uh on like Raganuga meditation or something. He could have done that, right? He could have said, Oh, let me write a book about how to meditate on Krishna's uh daily pastimes or right. how to meditate on his form and just like that's you told me to do that. But he gave this massive work. And, and, you know, as we're doing the recap, it, is, it became still more apparent to me. Where does he start? He's got to glorify Krishna. He's been told by his guru to more directly glorify Krishna. And, um, but he starts with the same characters that he, that, that we've all already fallen in love with in the Mahabharata, right? Kunti, right? We hear from Kunti how Krishna, you know, the whole reason why, you know, there's pearls in the, the, the oceans and, you know, 
the, 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 the fields are fruitful and the trees and, and the rivers are flowing and it is because of Krishna, because he's put his footprints, you know, on the earth and, and you know, and, 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 and when I know that, and when I see the connection with him everywhere, and this is where it gets practical, right? Then it doesn't matter what the calamities in life are because the, even the calamities make me remember him more and I feel enlivened and I transcend my my life, you know? So we hear from Kunti, we hear from Bhishma, you know? He wants to die right before Krishna, you know? And he gives a whole explanation about how all of these troublesome things in our lives, just try to understand them in context of Krishna and his will, you know? And then we go to, to Arjuna, you know, who comes home, Krishna's just left and Arjuna's saying, everything that I accomplished in my life, everything that we've accomplished, it was all because of Krishna, you know? And, and, and so he takes us right to those characters who are, who, are just, who are demonstrating the life lessons. And they're pointing us to that there's a more esoteric side, you know, that we're gonna get to, but yeah, we need to live the, they also stress the human side, right? So I, I think it's real helpful for us to understand, um, again, in, in presenting bhakti to people, that there's an esoteric side, which is really the, the devotional side, the deeply devotional side, and then there's a very practical side, a, a exoteric side, which is what people are more quick to understand and be more relevant to people. And that is those life lessons, you know, having an even mind. How about this? Being kind to others, you know? I, I think even as a brahmachari, if someone said that, I'd say, okay, you're teaching some wishy-washy kind of lovey-dovey thing about being kind to everyone. Mm -hmm. But actually, you know, that's Bhagavad Gita, you know, what makes one especially dear to Krishna, one who's kind to every living entity. You know, so, um, and, 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 in, and, in, and why do I need to be kind to someone? Because if I'm not kind, I get into all kind of disruptive, you know, uh, conflicts. And then when I go to absorb my mind in the holy name, my mind is distracted because my mind is always full of conflict. So we, you know, these are real, there's those very practical lessons. And then there's the esoteric. And if we understand, if we, if we can distinguish those two in our mind clearly, then when it comes time to explain these to people, we'll be able to do it much more. Fa like for instance, I was once at the Bhakti Center and there was a painting, I was showing some new people the temple mm. and there was a painting of Krishna lifting over down hill. And they said, what is this all about? You know, you know, explain this to me. And if I were just to immediately explain it purely from the esoteric side, it's esoteric by definition means that fewer people are going to be able to really understand it. Mm. And so I began with, you know, like what I, I just mentioned, you know, earlier is that like within this tradition, this very broad tradition that's all over India now around the world and goes back many thousands of years, they conceived of God, it was kind of nuanced. They, they, they believe that God is everywhere, you know, and they also believe that God is within the heart of every living being. And these are different, really important aspects of ways to understand or think about God. But they also believed that God could be known as a person. Okay. And, and, and now already you have them saying, okay, this is new and this is rational, you know? And then I say, so then there are texts that describe that person. And, and, and then you get to the point where you're saying, and the whole, the whole, re, you know, that, that divine person's, their whole enthusiasm and their whole purpose for life is actually in the exchange of, of love, you know, and, and how that love can be exchanged in all kinds of uh, varieties and in all kinds of circumstances. And they're saying that the way that we search for love in this world is really just a facsimile or a copy of, of what's our natural tendency from that spiritual realm. And this is a, and, the, and so you give this kind of context, you know, let me explain the practical to you and explain that there's an esoteric thing here go ahead and identify it as esoteric, right? And, and then, and so if I say to that, I'm gonna to explain to some, but it's esoteric. So without a lot of background in it, it's hard to fully understand it. It, it just kind of opens a person's mind to, to new ideas. That's amazing. So if I just say that that's, that's God and he's lifting up a mountain, well. <laughs> yeah, it's just, just like uh, it's... Lost everybody over there almost. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, so Bhagavatam, you know, um, is I think as long as we're able to do that, identify the esoteric, bring out the practical stuff, bring out the practical life lessons, as you were saying, it, it kind of builds someone's faith that if this book that's got so much wisdom, 
so much practical wisdom, you know, uh, explaining it with consistency and clarity throughout that when it comes time for the esoteric teachings, well, I'll be open to them. And if I'm open to the esoteric teachings, but I don't, exp but I don't embrace the life lessons, then I, I have um, a certain level of, my conceptions may be clear, but my practice won't be effective. Interesting. Right? I'll have the okay, Sambandha again, as you were mentioning, but I'm not yeah. practicing the Abhideya. That's true. So, you know, one of the things when I read Tamal Krishna Maharaj's uh, Servant of Servant, one thing that struck out in Prabhupada's letters to him was that because you are trying to serve Krishna sincerely, Krishna is giving you the intelligence. And Adami Buddhi Yogam Tam, the 1010 in the Gita, Prabhupada quotes yeah. it so many times in the letters that he is sending. So what you earlier said about when devotees mm. come together sincerely, patiently, with the desire to learn how to share, then Krishna guides. So I think this kind of contextualization is something which is uh, so important. And we see Prabhupada also did that. You know, Prabhupada, in some ways, when he talked about uh, chanting Hare Krishna, he said, stay high forever. So it does not just chant some esoteric mantra from somewhere which will develop your, your love of God. But he used that language, that framing. You know, you can go high and stay high forever. Yeah. So we could say in principle, we are following Prabhupada's example of, uh, although the way we may be presenting may be different, but we are actually following his example and fulfilling his purpose. Through you do this. it so well, Prabhu. And you know, one, one thought I would just like to share too is that, you know, in my involvement in the yoga world, in the, with the Bhakti Center, with Wisdom of the Sages, um, I, I'm happy and, and I respect any devotee that's trying to present Krishna consciousness with their own efforts and own ingenuity and own understanding, you know. I, I really think that um, the, the thing that holds us back the most is that we all stand on the side and criticize each other for, for how they're presenting Krishna consciousness. It's such a waste of time in my mind. Really, I think that it's really, um, we can discuss the details of how we present Krishna consciousness, um, what's more effective, what's less effective, um, and in different contexts. But to me, the most important thing is really that we appreciate one another and don't fight with one another about it and don't waste any energy on that kind of thing. If if one person is their their method is more effective, well, let's just give it time, you know, and see what see what comes, you know, if and 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 Krishna will reveal the results will reveal, you know, what's more effective or maybe both are effective or all three or all 10 ways are all worth pursuing and whoever's pursuing them and and, and that's become their the way that they express their their devotion and their service, then appreciate it, you know, and um, and no need to waste endless hours debating about you know, theorizing about what's you know, like Prabhupada said, we'll just you know go out and let your results speak for themselves, you know. So I really um, I have appreciation for any anyone who's trying to present bhakti sincerely, and uh, and then I say let's just. Uh, Let's all be open-minded and go out and, and, and share it in whatever ways we can and learn from one another. I learn a lot from you, Prabhu. You, you are, um, you, you, the way that you explain things is really, really helpful for me. Oh, that's your kind words. But, you know, I have spent a good amount of time trying to learn how people can learn. And one of the critical things that I learned was that, you know, the most important for part of a class for me as a speaker begins after the class. I give my class, but after that, when people start, what what spoke to them, what didn't speak to them, that what helps helps me become a better 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 sharer of the message in future. So what I do might improve the audience uh, understanding, may help the audience grow what I speak during the class. But what I hear after the class helps me grow. Mm. So I'm trying to learn in whatever way I can. Now, just maybe a couple of questions before. And we have sure. been, so 
going back to the earlier point of not quantifying okay uh, you know we discussed about outreach and uh, various ways but at the same level you know you have been successful in this it was impre- i knew that your podcast was very uh, very widely uh, appreciated but to be the number one podcast in religion spirituality within one year that's a huge achievement so now do you see in your years of yoga outreach uh, do you focus on or see like a translation of people or a elevation of people from where they are to going closer toward krishna and uh, maybe not necessarily becoming affiliated members of the movement but raising in their consciousness and becoming closer to krishna so in in your sense when you do this outreach what is it that gives you fulfillment hmm. what would be your uh, parameter for considering your outreach is successful um i yeah i guess um i definitely don't see it in 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 a way that i might have seen it 25 years ago you know in terms of a number of, of what to speak of people living in a temple mm. uh or, or you know or even initiation or something like that um i have life goals <laughs> that i would like to see you know before i die um in terms of like numbers of people that are practicing krishna consciousness say like in a city like new york city oh okay. i i do i do i do have aspirations uh that i would you know i'd like to be a part of working towards but uh you know in general i think when i see people um in it developing the same kind of um appreciation you could even say love for uh the bhakti tradition for hearing from bhagavatam hearing bhagavad gita enthusiasm for these verses enthusiasm for kirtan uh enthusiasm for the association of devotees enthusiasm for the holy dams when i see that someone is catching on thinking oh there's a this is where the real wealth in life lies this is what i want to bring more into my life uh and when i and i and when i hear of them or see them uh taking up that practice in 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 whatever their own way may be then yeah, i feel very fulfilled I, that's to me that's a victory you know mm-hmm. that's beautiful ultimately everybody has their relationship with krishna and we can only facilitate them in developing that and you know, that is uh, actually if you see that was the mood of shila prabhupad in his markine bhagavad dharma this is make my words understandable to them yeah. so i i find that as a uh, as a prime example of a prabhupad who is uh, who is quite different from what is often portrayed in the mainstream as a person who is you know smashing misconceptions and calling out people for their wrong ideas here prabhupad is simply wanting to be an instrument of the lord's compassion to assist people and uh, then how much we will be able to assist how much the lord wants us to be an instrument how people will people how long how far people will go through whatever we contribute to them that is all in one sense beyond our control yeah. but the way prabhupad puts it is you know, make me dance <laughs> so <laughs> it's such a extraordinary example of uh, you could say both a like, complete surrender and complete commitment mm you know right you do whatever you want with me but i am going to do my part yeah so you know also your question um it also reminds me you know so much of my attitudes and ideas and are, are shaped by my experience with radha swami hearing from him and being able to serve him and serve alongside him and uh i i i my experience has been that anything that i understand um that's true he understands it much more deeply than i do and he's proven that to me again and again and again and again in so many ways and um so that's given me the clue that um to try to understand things the way that he understands them i'll be able to think more deeply and for instance i'll share some experiences that i've had with him it's very similar to 
that, that, are, that are relevant to what you've just brought up. Once I was walking with him and one other devotee in Central Park in New York City. And um, we walked past a hot dog vendor, right? A person with a little hot dog stand selling hot dogs. Mm. But I think the person was probably Bangladeshi. Okay. And as we walked by, we all had bead bags in our hands. And as we walked past him, we we're a little bit of a distance and he saw us. And he, he, as we were walking past, he said, hurry bowl, hurry bowl, something like that, you know? And then as we continued walking, Radha Swami asked us a question. He said, there are so many devotees, initiated devotees, initiated by Srila Prabhupada, that have nothing but criticism for us. <laughs> you know, that like, they think we're doing everything wrong and bad, and they take, you know, a lot of effort to express that publicly and so on and so forth. And they're not happy when they see us and, you know, um, uh, and then here's a person that's selling hot dogs. But when they see us, they, they have nothing but appreciation for us and what we're doing. What, what does this mean? You know, how do we understand this? And the other devotee, and the <laughs> other devotee made, yeah. And the other devotee made a point and said that, um, our conceptions are very important, but our state of heart is still more important. Right, our our conception. So, in other words, is it a victory that if if um, is it a victory that people and more or less sign on the dotted line? I believe Krishna is Bhagavan, and that none of the devas are, and that you know, um, and that you know uh, he exists in Goloka Vrindavan, and you know, like conceptions I can embrace, but it doesn't necessarily mean that I've had a change of heart. And really the conceptions are only meant to assist our change of heart, you know. Some people's, their conceptions may not be as clear, but their heart may be um, more fertile for, for the seed of bhakti to grow. You know, I'm not, I'm not trying to diminish the need for the proper conceptions, that they're important. But just because we have the proper conceptions doesn't mean that we've had any real change of heart, any real softening of heart. And even... Even our conceptions can can foster our own sense of um, pride if we're not careful. True. You know, this is so. Uh, it speaks so much to my experience also. Uh, I feel that uh, what we often do, we use the philosophy to create labels, and then we reduce people to those labels. Oh, this person is a meat eater. This person is an alcoholic. This person is a Mayavadi. But people are multidimensional. Mm -hmm. And this applies for non-devotees, or I don't even like the word non-devotees, but for a lack of yeah. a better word. But this applies for people who are not practicing. And even for devotees, you know, we might apply a label like this devotee is a liberal devotee. And then liberal becomes so big that the part that is a devotee, it becomes like a footnote. <laughs> so yes somebody might be liberal and somebody might be conservative but they're devotees and uh, yeah. people are multidimensional and uh, it it's important to find out what is good in people not what is bad so it's it's i feel that sometimes philosophy can if that what you said about not the change in the change of uh, if you don't work on the heart enough then philosophy can become a tool for uh, a tool that actually we may not we may refute philosophical impersonalism but in terms of psychologically we might become impersonal we just remove the heart from the picture and we operate entirely at the level of the head and we we operate through the filter of those labels and it's it's quite unfortunate and alienating it's alienating that's yeah that's the point right and, and so as I'm growing older, I'm probably a little older than you, you know, I'm getting, I'm getting, uh, I'm getting up in, in the years now. And I, I look back at my, my years of, you know, it's been, you know, 30 some years now. I've been trying to practice bhakti well. Mm. <clears throat> it's, it's becoming clear to me through association with certain people and, and, and through their association and their example, you know, again and again, reading uh, the books, you know, Bhagavad Gita and, and Bhagavatam you know, what does it look like? What am I meant to look like before I die? What, what, you know, my, how I, how it, for my heart to be able to fully embrace uh, Radha and Krishna, um, you know, with genuine love, 
what kind of person do I need to be that I'm not right now? What does it look like? You know, and, and, and it gets to that, you know, so, something towards that more stereotypical looking sadhu, you know, that, that person that, that everybody that meets them feels, um, this is someone special. This, this, this is a person that understood me like others don't understand me because they're seeing beyond the labels, because they're actually seeing me as a soul, that they're not judging me for my shortcomings, that they actually really have a genuine affection for me. That's what, the, you know, when we hear about the six Goswamis and how they lived or, you know, other great sadhus, that the, they had this effect on people. And, to the, and, and, I, and I know people in my own life that I see they have that effect on people. You know, they, they, mm -hmm. they, they generally do. All my proper conceptions don't guarantee that, that that I become that person. I could, and actually, people may, as you said, feel alienated by me if there is no change of heart. So before I die, you know, I'm working on that. I wanna, I wanna really have that change of heart. You know, I I really want to be that person that sees the soul in everyone, that's always in communicate, that feels the constant presence of the Paramatma in my own heart, and is seeing that in the heart of every living being. That 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 depth of um, presence of of the Paramatma's presence in my mind and heart, that it it begins to really purify, elevate my the way that I speak and the way that I relate to others, um, and that I move through this world in that way, really being able to um, really being able to move people. You know, I'll, I'll share something else. Is like in my years at the Bhakti Center. I've had many, I've had many um, times where I felt like, oh, you know, something's, people are doing things that aren't right or that are wrong. And, you know, I would go to someone like Radha Swami, you know, more or less like presenting it and, and, and kind of almost asking him to correct it, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I see that he doesn't operate the way that I would normally think a person would just step in and say, hey, this is right and this is wrong. And now everyone start doing things right, you know? His way of operating is much more subtle, and and I I've tried to learn from that. I'm still trying to learn from that. Um, and I see he can see many steps down. You know, he can see many steps down the road. That if I if I treat a person like this right now, it might temporarily correct a problem, but in the long term. The, the same investment of heart and so on won't be there. You know, he, he kind of has a deeper understanding. And um, and I've also realized that if I'm actually going to serve him, I'm going to not just know what's right and wrong, but I actually have to become a new person that people will follow. <laughs> you know, I can't just say, hey, you, you, you're, you, you're, they have faith in you. Get everyone to follow me. I have to become, the reason that people are, have faith in him is because of the way that he is as a person, you know, what he embodies as a Vaishnava. And if I really want to be able to serve him, I need to begin to embody those things myself so that people will have faith in me. And, and then they'll, you know, they'll, they'll more follow what I have to say. So, and I'm, so not, I'm not able to get the connection between the two points. That he doesn't operate by telling what is right or wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And the other point is that I have to become a person like uh, who people will be inspired to follow. Yeah. So, I mean, what is the connection between the two? Be because, like, say say I have more experience than another, than someone else, right? I've been practicing okay. bhakti for 30 years and you've been practicing for three, hmm. right? You should just do what I say because it's right, you know? Um, but uh, certainly Americans, <laughs> right? with our very sense of independent thought and, and, and so on, they're not gonna necessarily follow what I say or have faith in me. Um, the, the, it's actually, re, when they actually feel ins that, I've, that I've given them something deep in life, you know, and inspired them deeply in life, and that's gonna come because of a, 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 a sensitivity in the way that I've operated with them and, and, and through that sensitivity, them feeling that I care about them, that I'm not just imposing something, but that a deep trust builds based on character. Then people will fought, then that has power to, to, to actually move people and to lead. And it's, and it's, and it's not merely like a, um, 
you know, a, a question of seniority or a question of knowing more or something like that, but it's, it's faith that's built on character, you know? Mm. So what you're and saying if, is that when you see that example, so although Maharaj may not uh, tell people, but still do this or don't do this, but still people follow him out of the inspiration. Yes. You're saying that you also like to not focus so much on the right or wrong, telling it yeah. explicitly, but by the example or by the inspiration coming from the example, people yeah. it's almost organically or osmotically uh, move in that direction. And what I've practically found that um, I can't get people to do what I want them to do, right? I can't. I don't have that power. I don't have that influence. And I've seen influential Vaishnavas that have that, that it's not something cheap. It's not something based on seniority. It's not something based on learning. It's, mm. it's, it's something, especially it's based on character, you know, and, and realization, depth of realization that, that manifests through your character. Mm. There's no easy way. True. And uh, so this actually was what my last question, which I had was that, yeah. you know, I saw your introduction and I said that that reflects what you're doing. It's quite a, you could say, a non-institutional introduction. You say that you are a monk for so long and you have connected with the Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition. So I have also noticed that people seem to have certain reser reservations about institutionalized religion. And at the same time, they are ready to connect with uh, spiritual spiritual people, spiritual teachers, or sp if they're inspired by someone. So in some ways, um, we with our standards and other things, we do come off as a heavily institutionalized form of religion. Um, so how do you deal with that challenge? And in a sense, you said that we don't assume authority and we actually, by our example, inspire. But are there some specific things which you have done to address that issue? I can see that you don't, uh, like you use directly in Wisdom of the Sages, you're using Prabhupada's books directly, using Prabhupada's purports. And so in that sense, you are not uh, concealing things. But at the same time, how do you, how do you deal with that uh, challenge? Um, I guess I could answer that question in two ways. Is like, how do I explain the institution? Or the institutional side of it that's one question okay and then the uh, or the other way to look at it is in general how do i present myself you know which oh. i think we've been talking about already quite a bit I think that, right? that's the first part is done yeah i think the second part yeah. is done maybe the first part it's a good way to exp uh divide the question yeah well then you know if so, so and just to recap I, it, it in a nutshell the second part of the question that i just mentioned like in other words how do I present myself or how do I present Bhakti? It, it has a lot to do with those practical life lessons, that wisdom aspect of how I'm going to go from a, a person confused and disturbed in this material world to a person that can move through this world with an even mind and, and, a, and a peaceful mind and, and that reflects in, in my, my relationships, et cetera, et cetera. That's all relevant stuff and, and that's what we're presenting. So then, okay, but aren't you attached to this institution and what about... Are there problems with the institution? Should I be involved in the institution? You know, et cetera. The way that I generally present this, and I think the way that Raghunath presents it is kind of like, um, I, I'm not going to try to paint a super rosy picture. I'm not going to, th I don't see that as what's going to help, right? Trying to cover up any blemishes and and um, present a super rosy picture of the, of the institution. But in a very genuine way, I can express how I benefited from the institution. And in a very practical way, I can explain how I understand that all institutions are going to have problems. So if you're going to come to me with a laundry list of problems, I would say, yeah, of course, it's an institution, <laughs> you know, it's going to have problems. But it's, but this is the way that, that, that I and, and, and my friends, this is the, this is the way that we've approached the institution and, and, and we and we feel, um, we feel, um, loyal, I guess you could say loyal to the institution or, or wanting to contribute and help the and serve the institution is because this institution found me, it explained to me all this knowledge, it provided for me unlimited opportunities, it, it introduced me to so many fascinating and, and helpful people, it, it's done so much, it's provided everything I need, right, for my spiritual life. Um, so yeah, there may be problems around it, I'll, I'll, I'll do the best I can to, to help the institution get over those problems. 
There may have been some, there, even to this day, there may be people in the institution that I really can't relate to. That's okay. I don't have to closely associate with those people. I, I can find the people within the institution that, that are helpful for me and, 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 uh, and benefit from, from them. So that, that's, that's, you know, that's kind of the way that, that uh, I would say like myself or Raghunath kind of present our connection. It's given us everything that we have. If, if you're appreciating what we're giving, it's all coming through this institution. You know, so we have, so if you appreciate what we're presenting, then it, it shouldn't surprise you that we appreciate the institution that's, that's presented it all to us. Beautifully put, Prabhu. So, you know, this is, I also struggle with this because in a sense, I'm a monk, I am much more rigidly affiliated with the institution in my status as well as the vision, uh, in people's vision, because I'm directly yeah. that way. But what I have also, uh, what, in a sense, you are saying the same thing that we see the institution as a as a valuable, even vital source of spirituality. But we don't equate the institution with the spirituality. Hmm. So it's like your spiritual... You have such a great ability. To... <laughs> Excellent. Well, so, you articulated so well. Please continue. Yeah, yeah so, you know, so it's when, peop when we start... Uh, reducing spirituality to the institution then it is a problem but if we start in one sense reducing spirituality as separated from the institution entirely then it becomes too ethereal too abstract and uh, you could say like the user earlier were too, too wishy-washy so there has to be some concrete form also just like the soul needs a body although the body is uh, in so many ways uh, a source of trouble and distress but the soul can't function in the world without the body. So hmm. Similarly, for spirituality to be effective in the world, it needs some form of embodiment. Hmm. So we don't, we don't like we often say, Prabhupada said, Iskon is my body. And Prabhupada also taught, we are not our bodies. Hmm. <laughs> so in, in that sense, I find that embodiment metaphor. So for the soul to realize itself as a soul, the body is required. So we don't reduce the soul to the body. But we don't uh, reject the body for the sake of the soul. Saying the soul is entirely mm -hmm. different from the body. So I try to present the institution that way. That it is... Excellent. Mm, so actually in one sense you did the same thing. But I allowed the phrasing that the institution has given me everything of value that I have. Yeah. And it is so true. You know, there may be many things which, which, which have caused us heartburn. And which may cause others heartburn. But yeah. beyond that... It is everything that we have value. It has come from the institution. Yeah. So the, 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 you've, you've expressed it so well. You know, my one uh, thought that I've often had is that you know, there's real institutional thought, right? Someone that's like really invested in the institution, and and maybe we uh, another thinker, a, a deeper thinker, might say, you know what? There's a lack of depth to to the realization they've become very deeply attached to this institution but the, the spirituality that the institution is meant to embody i don't see it very deeply in them as a matter of fact i see a lot of issues and a lot of problems a lot of superficial stuff i reject the institution and then that person is feeling themselves to be a, a particularly deep thinker and i think people are prone to seeing that sort of rebellion as being necessarily deep deeper you know and perhaps it may be, or deeper on one level, although even that so-called deeper thinker may lack a lot of the fundamentals to, to, to deep spirituality, like surrender, like, you know, being able to appreciate others, letting go of cynicism and so on. They may be, they may actually be more deeply, pro these may be serious problems with that thinker. But my observation, you know, there's a thesis and antithesis, and then there's ultimately a synthesis, you know. So you have your institutional thought and then your anti-institutional thought. Mm. My observation is that the people that I respect that as being the deepest are commonly found on the borders of the institution, right? Like they're kind of like on the edges of the institution in the sense that um, they're not, they're, they're, they're not, their spirituality or their approach hasn't become bound tightly by a set of rules or etiquettes or um, limitations. Uh, they can see the good beyond their institution and appreciate it. 
even gain from it, learn from it. Uh, they can recognize the problems within the institution as well as the good that's within the institution. They may be misunderstood within the institution, but they're actually serving the institution. That, like uh, that, that's like, I feel a lot of the deepest thinkers are kind of like in that space, you know? Mm, beautiful. Truly at, detached, at, you know? At, at the yeah. border, in one sense, uh, so you can see the good outside the institution. If you're too attached to the institution, we don't see the bad inside the institution and we can't see the good outside the institution. Then that leads mm -hmm. to like a very uh, polarizing we they mentality, which is yes. not healthy at all. But mm -hmm. as you said that just rebellion is no sign of spirituality in a sense. So we see the all the bad in the institution, but then there is good also. So that balanced approach, I can see the good outside the institution. I can see, I cannot deny the bad inside the institution, but I see the good also over there. And then I focus on the good. I appreciate that. And I try to be a part of that and I develop that. So it's a true, in a sense, like going, I just uh, going back to your earlier point about people who are at age of 40 and they have certain life experiences, which make them spiritually receptive. So, you know, I have also seen that those, who, even those who are dedicated institutional leaders, but just by being a leader of institution, they get some life experiences. Mm. And that also makes them spiritually mature mm. because in a sense, realizations come by functioning in the world. Now, of course, sometimes people, some fun people may function so rigidly within the framework of the institution that uh, you know, they, they, their minds don't open up. But I feel that any way one is actually interacting in the material with the material world with a spiritual purpose or at least with a spiritual receptivity. But that interaction brings realizations. So mm. even if for argument's sake, we say the entire institution is mundane, but still making that institution function in the world brings some life experience. And that life experience right. enhances one's spirituality. And what to speak of that institution is not mundane. At least it's meant for a spiritual purpose. Then, so I have, as I had traveled across the world and, uh, and although I clearly acknowledge that uh, our moon, our temples are not suited for Western outreach. But still, I have a lot of respect for all the temple leaders also. Because, you know, they are, they are operating under, under a challenging environment. Now, we may say that we are getting only Indians. But even getting Indians is not easy. It's relatively, it's easier as... a whole lot of other things with your life. <laughs> it's easier than maybe getting Westerners. But, yeah. you know, the caliber of Indians who come to America... They are probably the best among Indians, most talented, most dedicated. And uh, if that kind of Indians were coming to Indian temples, we would be immensely proud of them. Mm. So the fact that even our temples are able to attract thoughtful, intelligent, dedicated, successful Indians, that is, that is not a matter to be in any way minimized. And that our sure. leadership is able to attract that. That level also people. So that is also to be appreciated. It's just that there is a bigger universe also to reach out. Yeah. And then we need a resource. We need the appropriate forums for that. So so well expressed. Thank you. Prabhu, you are, you are you know, both a reservoir of wisdom and a stimulator of wisdom, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> if something is coming out of me, that this your association is so stimulating. So should I try to summarize, Prabhu? We went over please. a lot of distance, but yes, please. See. So I think we started with uh, discussing your journey. So how the little lesser known um, was it hard rock? Was it called the counterculture? The smaller expression of the hardcore, counter <laughs> hardcore, hardcore punk rock, hardcore punk rock counterculture in the eighties, and how that, in one sense, prepared you with uh, a level of you know, unconcern for societal rejection when you eventually started practicing bhakti, which at that time was quite radical to do. And that um, the fact that Prabhupada's books presented wisdom in a way in which, you know, like these uh, tough people were able to not only understand, but present. So that yeah. says that Prabhupada's style had its, means has its resonance uh, with uh, people, with at least people of a, particular demographic. That's how it's worked. So we talked about how, you know, 
people who were rebellious, Prabhupada's presentation actually pres uh, gave them a philosophical foundation and spiritual direction for their rebellion. That happened in the 60s and that happened to some extent in the yeah. 80s also. And then I, I especially appreciated your analysis of how when at that time you came to Krishna consciousness or you met Tamal Krishna Maharaj and it was just that you felt that this is, this is, this is the path for me. This is what I want to do. So, and then we talked mo more about the 2000 when you started entering into the yoga. So that culture of critical questioning, uh, critical thinking, which you learned from Maharaj, I think that was a, that is a special legacy, which uh, prepared you for, uh, you know, evaluating different strategies for outreach and then seeing what works. And uh, then the vision of uh, a, reaching out to people by providing multiple forums. This temple is just one forum. There is yoga, there are other things available. That is, uh, you know, through your interaction with Maharaj that started off. And then I think in the yoga scene, you were, you were able to connect with a niche where there were people who were serious and thoughtful. And so although it was, it may not be the mainstream culture, but it was, it was uh, a part which was like with thoughtful, influential people. And uh, uh, what you said about, you know, what in our presentation is relevant for people today. So to understand that, we look at how society has changed. And uh, one of the biggest influencers is say uh, three decades of computing and two, one and a half decades of social media. So it has decreased people's attention spans and their capacity to even read serious philosophical books. And that's why having, say, reading groups, which uh, provide people not only the impetus for reading, uh, but also a safe forum for asking questions without being judged, which may not happen in our temples, that they are so vital. And one difference is say, that in the reading group, so the temple classes are meant more for education for people who have other forums for connection. But the reading groups are like, they are themselves forums for connection for people. And that's why the format has to be significantly different. Then you talked about con avoiding condescension. That what one of the reasons for the success of your Wisdom of Sages podcast is not that, you know, we are enlightened and we are going to enlighten you. Rather, you know, we are all facing the same life challenges, but we have got some resources which from our bhakti, from our practice and training and education in bhakti, and we would like to share that. So that horizontal approach, as compared to the vertical approach, has a far greater reach. And that uh, horizontal, uh, no, in one sense, the vertical approach worked with Srila Prabhupada because the, the people who came to him, they were from an authoritarian background or an authority-centered society, but they rejected that authority and they could replace, eventually when they found a trustworthy authority, they could replace uh, their uh, rejected authority with Prabhupada. But in today's world, people have not no experience of following any authority. So a vertical approach is more likely to alienate than attract. And then you talked about how in the association of devotees with sincerity and patience, we gradually learn how, what, what clicks with people, what, what we can share with people. And you mentioned about the Bhagavatam. There are so many practical takeaways in the Bhagavatam and uh, separating the esoteric and the exoteric or the practical and knowing what to present when. So the way you explained uh, Govardhan Leela, not just in terms of what is literally depicted in the picture, but by framing a universe of love and showing that as a, as a extraordinary example of reciprocation of love. Now that contextualization is uh, vital. So we talked about two aspects. You know, one is personal connection with people and then rational explanation of the philosophy. So when we do those two things, then there is a, there a lot of minds and hearts can be opened. And then we also talked about uh, the aspect of institution towards the end, that how you, know, you present yourself as an individual who has experiences and you are sharing those experiences. And, but as an institution, the institution has given us everything of value, but we don't paint a rosy picture of the institution as, uh, as being everything good. It's like every institution will have some bad. Something's bad, but 
we look at the good and the most effective leaders are those who who you know who 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 are connected you can say even committed to the institution but they are not constrained by the institution you know they are not limited by it. they can appreciate the good outside also and uh, we did not discuss so much specifically about yoga uh, in our podcast but it was the broad audience which is uh, the contemporary audience in which the yoga crowd is a big crowd so you did although you didn't teach yoga but the attempt to learn yoga put you in an environment where you know you actually connected with people at a ground level and that provided you the experience and the wisdom to l- see how we could connect with people we also discussed about quantifying success that you know more than uh, like having some uh, like institutional goals of where people need to come to you know ultimately everybody has a relationship with krishna and if their life they are growing toward krishna then that is a valuable contribution we are doing and then uh, we also in the between we discussed about the say the history of how our movement has evolved and not evolved in certain ways but the uh, we don't have to say that this is the only way to reach out to western audiences but instead of fighting about who is presenting krishna consciousness how you know if we just present according to our realization and if something works we learn from it and we grow so that internecine fighting if it is avoided anybody who is making the endeavor to reach out itself needs to be appreciated but sometimes we may reduce people and label people like you talked about that experience of a hot dog vendor appreciating a devotee and you know some devotee is not appreciating devotees so the problem is that we might uh, label and reduce people so philosophical conceptions and philosophic correctness of the conceptions is important but ultimately they are tools for the change of heart so in a sense that approach you know, that we also in the start discussed how the you know, people are today they're not so interested in the alternative way of living but they're interested in you know, how we can add value in their lives so yeah. you present practical lessons from scripture you present the practical value of institution you know, the practical connections with people help them face their life challenges and then they become more receptive to the esoteric the spiritual and then they grow organically so any points you want to add or anything <laughs> oh no, that was very thorough <laughs> Well done. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. It was a very stimulating discussion. And you know, thank uh, you so much, Prabhu. Thank you for sharing your heart. Hare Krishna. Yeah. Hare Krishna. I, be- I benefit so much from your teachings. So thank you. It's been an honor to be on your podcast. It's been an honor for me. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much, Prabhu.